Volume Two, Chapter Three of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Emma could not forgive her, but as neither provocation nor resentment were discerned by Mr. Knightley, who had been of the party, and had seen only proper attention and pleasing behaviour on each side, he was expressing the next morning, being at Hartfield again on business with Mr. Woodhouse, his approbation of the whole, not so openly as he might have done had her father been out of the room, but speaking plain enough to be very intelligible to Emma. He had been used to think her unjust to Jane, and had now great pleasure in marking an improvement. "'A very pleasant evening,' he began, as soon as Mr. Woodhouse had been talked into what was necessary, told that he understood, and the paper swept away. "'Particularly pleasant. You and Miss Fairfax gave us some very good music. I do not know a more luxurious state, sir, than sitting at one's ease to be entertained a whole evening by two such young women, sometimes with music and sometimes with conversation.' I am sure Miss Fairfax must have found the evening pleasant, Emma. You left nothing undone. I was glad you made her play so much, for having no instrument at her grandmother's, it must have been a real indulgence. I am happy you approved, said Emma, smiling, but I hope I am not often deficient in what is due to guests at Hartfield. No, my dear, said her father instantly, that I am sure you are not. There is nobody half so attentive and civil as you are. If anything, you are too attentive." the muffin last night. If it had been handed round once, I think it would have been enough. No, said Mr. Knightley, nearly at the same time, you are not often deficient, not often deficient either in manner or comprehension. I think you understand me, therefore. An arch look expressed, I understand you well enough, but she said only, Miss Fairfax is reserved. I always told you she was, a little, but you will soon overcome all that part of her reserve which ought to be overcome, all that has its foundation in diffidence." What arises from discretion must be honoured. You think her diffident. I do not see it. My dear Emma, said he, moving from his chair into one close by her, you are not going to tell me, I hope, that you had not a pleasant evening. Oh, no, I was pleased with my own perseverance in asking questions, and amused to think how little information I obtained. I am disappointed, was his only answer. I hope everybody had a pleasant evening, said Mr. Woodhouse in his quiet way. I had— once I felt the fire rather too much, but then I moved back my chair a little, a very little, and it did not disturb me. Miss Bates was very chatty and good-humoured, as she always is, though she speaks rather too quick. However, she is very agreeable, and Mrs. Bates, too, in a different way. I like old friends, and Miss Jane Fairfax is a very pretty sort of young lady, a very pretty and a very well-behaved young lady indeed. She must have found the evening agreeable, Mr. Knightley, because she had Emma." "'True, sir, and Emma, because she had Miss Fairfax.' Emma saw his anxiety, and wishing to appease it, at least for the present, said, and with a sincerity which no one could question, "'She is a sort of elegant creature that one cannot keep one's eyes away from. I am always watching her to admire, and I do pity her from my heart.' Mr. Knightley looked as if he were more gratified than he cared to express, and before he could make any reply, Mr. Woodhouse, whose thoughts were on the Bateses, said, it is a great pity that their circumstances should be so confined, a great pity indeed. And I have often wished, but it is so little one can venture to do, small, trifling presents of anything uncommon. Now we have killed a porker, and Emma thinks of sending them a loin or a leg. It is very small and delicate. Hartfield pork is not like any other pork. But still it is pork, and my dear Emma, unless one could be sure of their making it into steaks— nicely fried, as ours are fried, without the smallest grease, and not roast it, for no stomach can bear roast pork. I think we had better send the leg. Do you not think so, my dear? My dear papa, I sent the whole hind quarter. I knew you would wish it. There will be the leg to be salted, you know, which is so very nice, and the loin to be dressed directly in any manner they like. That's right, my dear, very right. I had not thought of it before, but that is the best way." They must not oversalt the leg, and then, if it is not oversalted, and if it is very thoroughly boiled, just as Cyril boils ours, and eaten very moderately of, with a boiled turnip, and a little carrot or parsnip, I do not consider it unwholesome. "'Emma,' said Mr. Knightley presently, "'I have a piece of news for you. You like news, and I heard an article on my way hither that I think will interest you.' "'News? Oh, yes, I always like news. What is it? Why do you smile so? Where did you hear it? at Randall's? He had time only to say, No, not at Randall's. I have not been near Randall's. 
when the door was thrown open and Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax walked into the room. Full of thanks and full of news, Miss Bates knew not which to give quickest. Mr. Knightley soon saw that he had lost his moment, and that not another syllable of communication could rest with him. "'Oh, my dear sir, how are you this morning? My dear Miss Woodhouse, I come quite overpowered. Such a beautiful hindquarter of pork. You are too bountiful. Have you heard the news? Mr. Elton is going to be married.' Emma had not time even to think of Mr. Elton, and she was so completely surprised that she could not avoid a little start, and a little blush at the sound. "'There is my news. I thought it would interest you,' said Mr. Knightley, with a smile which implied a conviction of some part of what had passed between them. "'But where could you hear it?' cried Miss Bates. "'Where could you possibly hear it, Mr. Knightley? For it is not five minutes since I received Mrs. Cole's note. No, it cannot be more than five, or at least ten for I had got my bonnet and spencer on, just ready to come out. I was only gone down to speak to Patty again about the pork. Jane was standing in the passage, were you not, Jane? For my mother was so afraid that we had not any salting-pan large enough. So I said I would go down and see, and Jane said, Shall I go down instead? For I think you have a little cold, and Patty has been washing the kitchen. Oh, my dear, said I. Well, and just then came the note. A Miss Hawkins, that's all I know, a Miss Hawkins of Bath. "'But, Mr. Knightley, how could you possibly have heard it? "'For the very moment Mr. Cole told Mrs. Cole of it, "'she sat down and wrote to me. "'A uh, Miss Hawkins—' "'I was with Mr. Cole on business an hour and a half ago. "'He had just read Elton's letter as I was shown in, "'and handed it to me directly. "'Well, that is quite—' "'I suppose there never was a piece of news more generally interesting. "'My dear sir, you really are too bountiful. "'My mother desires her very best compliments and regards, "'and a thousand thanks, and says you really quite oppress her.' "'We consider our Hartfield pork,' replied Mr. Woodhouse. "'Indeed, it certainly is, so very superior to all other pork, that Emma and I cannot have a greater pleasure than—oh, my dear sir, as my mother says, our friends are only too good to us. If there were ever people who, without having great wealth themselves, had everything they could wish for, I am sure it is us. We may well say that our lot is cast in a goodly heritage. Well, Mr. Knightley, and so you actually saw the letter. Well, it was short—' merely to announce, but cheerful, exulting, of course. Here was a sly glance at Emma. He had been so fortunate as to—I forget the precise words. One has no business to remember them. The information was, as you state, that he was going to be married to a Miss Hawkins. By his style, I should imagine it just settled. "'Mr. Elton going to be married,' said Emma, as soon as she could speak. "'He will have everybody's wishes for his happiness.' "'He is very young to settle,' was Mr. Woodhouse's observation. "'He had better not be in a hurry.' He seemed to me very well off as he was. We were always glad to see him at Hartfield. "'A new neighbour for us all, Miss Woodhouse,' said Miss Bates, joyfully. "'My mother is so pleased. She says she cannot bear to have the poor old vicarage without a mistress. This is great news indeed. Jane, you have never seen Mr. Elton. No wonder that you have such a curiosity to see him.' Jane's curiosity did not appear of that of an absorbing nature as wholly to occupy her. "'No, I have never seen Mr. Elton,' she replied, starting on this appeal. "'Is he—is he a tall man?' "'Who shall answer that question?' cried Emma. "'My father would say yes, Mr. Knightley no, and Miss Bates and I that he is just the happy medium. When you have been here a little longer, Miss Fairfax, you will understand that Mr. Elton is the standard of perfection in Highbury, both in person and mind.' "'Very true, Miss Woodhouse, so she will. He is the very best young man.' "'But, my dear Jane, if you remember, I told you yesterday he was precisely the height of Mr. Perry. Miss Hawkins, I dare say, an excellent young woman. His extreme attention to my mother, wanting her to sit in the vicarage pew, that she might hear the better, for my mother is a little deaf, you know. It is not much, but she does not hear quite quick. Jane says that Colonel Campbell is a little deaf. He fancied bathing might be good for it, the warm bath, but she says it did him no lasting benefit. Colonel Campbell, you know, is quite our angel.' and Mr. Dixon seems a very charming young man, quite worthy of him. It is such a happiness when good people get together, and they always do. Now here will be Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, and there are the Coles, such very good people, and the Perrys. I suppose there never was a happier or a better couple than Mr. and Mrs. Perry. I say, sir, turning to Mr. Woodhouse, I think there are few places with such society as Highbury. I always say, we are quite blessed in our neighbours. My dear sir, if there is one thing my mother loves better than another, it is pork, a roast loin of pork. As to who or what Miss Hawkins is, or how long he has been acquainted with her, said Emma, nothing, I suppose, can be known. One feels that it cannot be a very long acquaintance. He has been gone only four weeks. Nobody had any information to give, and after a few more wonderings, Emma said, You are silent, Miss Fairfax, but I hope you mean to take an interest in this news. 
you who have been hearing and seeing so much of late on these subjects, who must have been so deep in the business on Miss Campbell's account, we shall not excuse your being indifferent about Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins.' "'When I have seen Mr. Elton,' replied Jane, "'I dare say I shall be interested, but I believe it requires that with me. And, as it is some months since Miss Campbell married, the impression may be a little worn off.' "'Yes, he has been gone just four weeks, as you observe, Miss Woodhouse,' said Miss Bates. Four weeks yesterday. A Miss Hawkins. Well, I had always rather fancied it would be some young lady hereabouts. Not that I ever—' Miss Cole once whispered to me, but I immediately said, "'No, Mr. Elton is a most worthy young man, but—' In short, I do not think I am particularly quick at those sorts of discoveries. I do not pretend to it. What is before me, I see. At the same time, nobody could wonder if Mr. Elton should have aspired. Miss Woodhouse lets me chatter on so good-humouredly. She knows I would not offend for the world. How does Miss Smith do? She seems quite recovered now. Have you heard from Mrs. John Knightley lately? Oh, those dear little children! Jane, do you know I always fancy Mr. Dixon like Mr. John Knightley? I mean, in person— tall, with that sort of look, and not very talkative. "'Quite wrong, my dear aunt. There is no likeness at all. Very odd, but one never does form a just idea of anybody beforehand. One takes up a notion and runs away with it. Mr. Dixon, you say, is not, strictly speaking, handsome?' "'Handsome? Oh, no, far from it. Certainly plain. I told you he was plain. My dear, you said that Miss Campbell would not allow him to be plain, and that you yourself—' "'Oh, as for me, my judgment is worth nothing.' Where I have a regard, I always think a person well-looking. But I gave what I believed the general opinion when I called him plain. Well, my dear Jane, I believe we must be running away. The weather does not look well, and Grandmamma will be uneasy. You are too obliging, my dear Miss Woodhouse, but we really must take leave. This has been a most agreeable piece of news, indeed. I shall just go round by Mrs. Cole's, but I shall not stop three minutes. And, Jane, you had better go home directly. I would not have you out in a shower. We think she is the better for Highbury already. "'Thank you, we do indeed. I shall not attempt calling on Mrs. Goddard, for I really do not think she cares for anything but boiled pork. When we dress the leg it will be another thing. Good morning to you, my dear sir. Oh, Mr. Knightley is coming too. Well, that is so very—' I am sure if Jane is tired you will be so kind as to give her your arm. Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, good morning to you.' Emma, alone with her father, had half her attention wanted by him while he lamented that young people would be in such a hurry to marry, and to marry strangers too— and the other half she could give to her own view of the subject. It was to herself an amusing and a very welcome piece of news, as proving that Mr. Elton could not have suffered long, but she was sorry for Harriet. Harriet must feel it, and all that she could hope was, by giving the first information herself, to save her from hearing it abruptly from others. It was now about the time that she was likely to call. If she were to meet Miss Bates on her way, and upon its being to rain, Emma was obliged to expect that the weather would be detaining her at Mrs. Goddard's, and that the intelligence would undoubtedly rush upon her without preparation. The shower was heavy but short, and it had not been over five minutes, when in came Harriet, with just the heated, agitated look which hurrying thither with a full heart was likely to give, and the, oh, Miss Woodhouse, what do you think has happened, which instantly burst forth, had all the evidence of corresponding perturbation. As the blow was given, Emma felt that she could not show greater kindness than in listening, and Harriet, unchecked, ran eagerly through what she had to tell. She had set out for Mrs. Goddard's half an hour ago. She had been afraid it would rain. She had been afraid it would pour down every movement. But she thought she might get to Hartfield first. She had hurried on as fast as possible. But then, as she was passing by the house where a young woman was making up a gown for her, she thought she would just step in and see how it went on. And though she did not seem to stay half a moment there— Soon after she came out it began to rain, and she did not know what to do, so she ran on directly, as fast as she could, and took shelter at Ford's. Ford's was the principal woolen draper, linen draper, and haberdasher's shop united, the shop first in size and fashion in the place. And so there she had sat, without an idea of anything in the world, full ten minutes, perhaps, when all of a sudden who should come in? To be sure it was so very odd, but they always dealt at Ford's. Who should come in but Elizabeth Martin and her brother? "'Dear Miss Woodhouse, only think. I thought I should have fainted. I did not know what to do. I was sitting near the door. Elizabeth saw me directly, but he did not. He was busy with the umbrella. I am sure she saw me, but she looked away directly, and took no notice, and they both went to quite the farther end of the shop, and I kept sitting near the door. Oh, dear, I was so miserable. I am sure I must have been as white as my gown. I could not go away, you know, because of the rain, but I did so wish myself anywhere in the world but there.' 
"'Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse!' Well, at last, I fancy, he looked round and saw me, for instead of going on with her buyings, they began whispering to one another. I am sure they were talking of me, and I could not help thinking that he was persuading her to speak to me. Do you think he was, Miss Woodhouse? For presently she came forward, came quite up to me, and asked how I did, and seemed ready to shake hands if I would. She did not do any of it in the same way that she used. I could see she was altered." But, however, she seemed to try to be very friendly, and we shook hands, and stood talking some time. But I know no more what I said. I was in such a tremble. I remember she said she was sorry we never met now, which I thought almost too kind. Dear Miss Woodhouse, I was absolutely miserable. By that time it was beginning to hold up, and I was determined that nothing should stop me from getting away. And then, only think, I found he was coming up towards me, too. Slowly, you know, and as if he did not know quite what to do and so he came and spoke, and I answered, and I stood for a minute, feeling dreadfully, you know, one can't tell how, and then I took courage, and said it did not rain, and I must go, and so off I set, and I had not got three yards from the door when he came after me, only to say, if I was going to Hartfield, he thought I had much better go round by Mr. Cole's stables, for I should find the near way quite floated by this rain. Oh, dear, I thought it would have been the death of me, so I said I was very much obliged to him, you know I could not do less, and then he went back to Elizabeth, and I came round by the stables. I believe I did, but I hardly knew where I was, or anything about it. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I would rather done anything than have it happened, and yet, you know, there was a sort of satisfaction in seeing him behave so pleasantly and so kindly. And Elizabeth, too. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do talk to me and make me comfortable again. Very sincerely did Emma wish to do so, but it was not immediately in her power. She was obliged to stop and think. She was not thoroughly comfortable herself. The young man's conduct and his sister's seemed the result of real feeling, and she could not but pity them. As Harriet described it, there had been an interesting mixture of wounded affection and genuine delicacy in their behaviour. But she had believed them to be well-meaning, worthy people before, and what difference did this make in the evils of the connection? It was folly to be disturbed by it. Of course, he must be sorry to lose her. They must all be sorry." ambition as well as love, had probably been mortified. They might all have hoped to rise by Harriet's acquaintance, and besides, what was the value of Harriet's description? So easily pleased, so little discerning, what signified her praise? She exerted herself, and did try to make her comfortable, by considering all that had passed as a mere trifle, and quite unworthy of being dwelt on. "'It might be distressing for the moment,' said she, "'but you seem to have behaved extremely well, and it is over, and may never, can never, as a first meeting, occur again, and therefore you need not think about it.' Harriet said, "'Very true, and she would not think about it, but still she talked of it, still she could talk of nothing else, and Emma at last, in order to put the Martins out of her head, was obliged to hurry on the news, which she had meant to give with so much tender caution.' hardly knowing herself whether to rejoice or be angry, ashamed or only amused, at such a state of mind in poor Harriet, such a conclusion of Mr. Elton's importance with her. Mr. Elton's rights, however, gradually revived. Though she did not feel the first intelligence as she might have done the day before, or an hour before, its interest soon increased, and before their first conversation was over, she had talked herself into all the sensations of curiosity, wonder and regret, pain and pleasure, as to this fortunate Miss Hawkins, which could conduce to place the Martins under proper subordination in her fancy. Emma learned to be rather glad there had been such a meeting. It had been serviceable in deadening the first shock, without retaining any influence to alarm. As Harriet now lived, the Martins could not get at her, without seeking her, where hitherto they had wanted either the courage or the condescension to seek her, for, since her refusal of the brother, the sisters had never been at Mrs. Goddard's, and a twelve-month might pass without their being thrown together again, with any necessity, or even any power of speech. End of Volume 2, Chapter 3 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume 2, Chapter 4 of Emma by Jane Austen read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Human nature is so well disposed towards those who are in interesting situations, that a young person, who either marries or dies, is sure of being kindly spoken of. A week had not passed since Miss Hawkins's name was first mentioned in Highbury, before she was, by some means or other, discovered to have every recommendation of person and mind, 
to be handsome, elegant, highly accomplished, and perfectly amiable, and when Mr. Elton himself arrived to triumph in his happy prospects, and to circulate the fame of her merits, there was very little more for him to do than to tell her Christian name, and say whose music she principally played. Mr. Elton returned a very happy man. He had gone away rejected and mortified, disappointed in a very sanguine hope, after a series of what appeared to him strong encouragement, and not only losing the right lady, but finding himself debased to the level of a very wrong one. He had gone away deeply offended, he came back engaged to another, and to another as superior, of course, to the first, as under such circumstances what is gained always is to what is lost. He came back gay and self-satisfied, eager and busy, caring nothing for Miss Woodhouse, and defying Miss Smith. The charming Augusta Hawkins, in addition to all the usual advantages of perfect beauty and merit, was in possession of an independent fortune, of so many thousands as would always be called ten, a point of some dignity, as well as some convenience. The story well told, he had not thrown himself away, he had gained a woman of ten thousand pounds or thereabouts, and he had gained her with such delightful rapidity, the first hour of introduction had been so very soon followed by distinguishing notice, the history which he had to give Mrs. Cole of the rise and progress of the affair was so glorious, the steps so quick, from the accidental rencontre to the dinner at Mr. Green's and the party at Mrs. Brown's, smiles and blushes rising in importance, with consciousness and agitation richly scattered. The lady had been so easily impressed, so sweetly disposed, had, in short, to use a most intelligible phrase, been so very ready to have him, that vanity and prudence were equally contented. He had caught both substance and shadow, both fortune and affection, and was just the happy man he ought to be, talking only of himself and his own concerns, expecting to be congratulated, ready to be laughed at, and with cordial, fearless smiles, now addressing all the young ladies of the place, to whom a few weeks ago he would have been more cautiously gallant. The wedding was no distant event, as the parties had only themselves to please, and nothing but the necessary preparations to wait for, and when he set out for Bath again, there was a general expectation, which a certain glance at Mrs. Cole's did not seem to contradict, that when he next entered Highbury he would bring his bride. During his present short stay Emma had barely seen him, but just enough to feel that the first meeting was over, and to give her the impression of his not being improved by the mixture of pique and pretension, now spread over his air. She was, in fact, beginning very much to wonder that she had ever thought him pleasing at all, and his sight was so inseparably connected with some very disagreeable feelings, that except in a moral light, as a penance, a lesson, a source of profitable humiliation to her own mind, she would have been thankful to be assured of never seeing him again. She wished him very well, but he gave her pain, and his welfare twenty miles off would administer most satisfaction. The pain of his continued residence in Highbury, however, must certainly be lessened by his marriage. Many vain solicitudes would be prevented, many awkwardnesses smoothed by it. A Mrs. Elton would be an excuse for any change of intercourse. Former intimacy might sink without remark. It would be almost beginning their life of civility again. Of the lady, individually, Emma thought very little. She was good enough for Mr. Elton, no doubt, accomplished enough for Highbury, handsome enough to look plain, probably, by Harriet's side. As to connection, there Emma was perfectly easy, persuaded, that after all his own vaunted claims and disdain of Harriet, he had done nothing. On that article truth seemed unattainable. What she was must be uncertain, but who she was might be found out, and setting aside the ten thousand pounds, it did not appear that she was at all Harriet's superior. She brought no name, no blood, no alliance. Miss Hawkins was the youngest of the two daughters of a Bristol merchant. Of course, he must be called, but as the whole of the profits of his mercantile life appeared so very moderate, it was not unfair to guess the dignity of his line of trade had been very moderate also. Part of every winter she had been used to spend in Bath, but Bristol was her home, the very heart of Bristol, for though the father and mother had died some years ago, and uncle remained, in the law line, nothing more distinctly honourable was hazarded of him than that he was in the law line, and with him the daughter had lived. Emma guessed him to be the drudge of some attorney, and too stupid to rise. And all the grandeur of the connection seemed dependent on the elder sister, who was very well married, to a gentleman in a great way, near Bristol, who kept two carriages. That was the wind-up of the history, that was the glory of Miss Hawkins. Could she have but given Harriet her feelings about it all? She had talked her into love, but, alas, she was not so easily to be talked out of it. 
the charm of an object to occupy the many vacancies of Harriet's mind was not to be talked away. He might be superseded by another, he certainly would, indeed, nothing could be clearer, even a Robert Martin would have been sufficient, but nothing else, she feared, would cure her. Harriet was one of those who, having once begun, would always be in love. And now, poor girl, she was considerably worse from this reappearance of Mr. Elton. She was always having a glimpse of him somewhere or other. Emma saw him only once, but two or three times every day Harriet was sure just to meet with him, or just to miss him, or just to hear his voice, or see his shoulder, just to have something occur to preserve him in all her fancy, in all the favouring warmth of surprise and conjecture. She was, moreover, perpetually hearing about him, for, excepting when at Hartfield, she was always among those who saw no fault in Mr. Elton, and found nothing so interesting as the discussion of all his concerns, and every report, therefore, every guess, all that had already occurred, all that might occur in the arrangement of his affairs, comprehending income, servants, and furniture, was continually in agitation around her. Her regard was receiving strength by invariable praise of him, and her regrets kept alive, and feelings irritated, by ceaseless repetitions of Miss Hawkins's happiness, and continual observation of how much he seemed attached. His air as he walked by the house, the very sitting of his hat, all being in proof of how much he was in love. Had it been allowable entertainment, had there been no pain to her friend, or reproach to herself, in the waverings of Harriet's mind, Emma would have been amused by its variations. Sometimes Mr. Elton predominated, sometimes the Martins, and each was occasionally useful as a check to the other. Mr. Elton's engagement had been the cure of the agitation of meeting Mr. Martin. The unhappiness produced by the knowledge of that engagement had been a little put aside by Elizabeth Martin's calling at Mrs. Goddard's a few days afterwards. Harriet had not been at home, but a note had been prepared and left for her, written in the very style to touch, a small mixture of reproach, with a great deal of kindness, and till Mr. Elton himself appeared, she had been much occupied by it, continually pondering over what could be done in return, and wishing to do more than she dared to confess. But Mr. Elton in person had driven away all such cares. While he stayed, the Martins were forgotten, and on the very morning of his setting off for Bath again, Emma, to dissipate some of the distress it occasioned, judged it best for her to return Elizabeth Martin's visit. How that visit was to be acknowledged, what would be necessary, and what might be safest, had been a point of some doubtful consideration. Absolute neglect of the mother and sisters, when invited to come, would be ingratitude. It must not be, and yet the danger of a renewal of the acquaintance— after much thinking, she could determine on nothing better than Harriet's returning the visit, but in a way that, if they had understanding, should convince them that it was only to be a formal acquaintance. She meant to take her in the carriage, leave her at the Abbey Mill, while she drove a little farther, and call for her again so soon, as to allow no time for insidious applications or dangerous recurrences to the past, and give the most decided proof of what degree of intimacy was chosen for the future." She could think of nothing better, and, though there was something in it which her own heart could not approve, something of ingratitude, merely glossed over, it must be done, or what would become of Harriet? End of Volume 2, Chapter 4, read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 5 of Emma by Jane Austen read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Small heart had Harriet for visiting. Only half an hour before her friend called for her at Mrs. Goddard's, her evil stars had led her to the very spot where, at that moment, a trunk, directed to the Reverend Philip Elton, White Hart, Bath, was to be seen under the operation of being lifted into the butcher's cart, which was to convey it to where the coaches passed, and everything in this world, excepting that trunk and the direction, was consequently a blank. She went, however, and when they reached the farm, she was to be put down, at the end of the broad, neat gravel walk, which led between espalier apple-trees to the front door, the sight of everything which had given her so much pleasure the autumn before, was beginning to revive a little local agitation, and when they parted, Emma observed her to be looking around with a sort of fearful curiosity, which determined her not to allow the visit to exceed the proposed quarter of an hour. She went on herself to give that portion of time to an old servant who was married, and settled in Donwell. The quarter of an hour brought her punctually to the great white gate again, and Miss Smith, receiving her summons, was with her without delay, and unattended by any alarming young man. She came solitarily down the gravel walk, 
a Miss Martin just appearing at the door, and parting with her seemingly with ceremonious civility. Harriet could not very soon give an intelligible account. She was feeling too much. But at last Emma collected from her enough to understand the sort of meeting and the sort of pain it was creating. She had only seen Mrs. Martin and the two girls. They had received her doubtfully, if not coolly, and nothing beyond the merest commonplace had been talked almost all the time, till just at last, when Mrs. Martin's saying, all of a sudden, that she thought Miss Smith was grown, had brought on a more interesting subject, and a warmer manner. In that very room she had been measured last September, with her two friends. There were the pencilled marks and memorandums on the wainscot by the window. He had done it. They all seemed to remember the day, the hour, the party, the occasion, to feel the same consciousness, the same regrets, to be ready to return to the same good understanding, and they were just growing again like themselves, Harriet, as Emma must suspect, ready as the best of them to be cordial and happy, when the carriage reappeared, and all was over. The style of the visit and the shortness of it were then felt to be decisive. Fourteen minutes to be given to those with whom she had thankfully passed six weeks, not six months ago. Emma could not but picture it all, and feel how justly they might resent, how naturally Harriet must suffer. It was a bad business. She would have given a great deal, or endured a great deal, to have had the Martins in a higher rank of life. They were so deserving that a little higher should have been enough. But, as it was, how could she have done otherwise? Impossible. She could not repent. They must be separated, but there was a great deal of pain in the process, so much to herself at this time, that she soon felt the necessity of a little consolation, and resolved on going home by way of Randall's to procure it. Her mind was quite sick of Mr. Elton and the Martins. The refreshment of Randall's was absolutely necessary. It was a good scheme, but on driving to the door they heard that neither master nor mistress was at home. They had both been out some time. The man believed they were gone to Hartfield. "'This is too bad,' cried Emma, as they turned away. "'And now we shall just miss them. Too provoking. I do not know when I have been so disappointed.' And she leaned back in the corner, to indulge her murmurs, or to reason them away, probably a little of both, such being the commonest process of a not ill-disposed mind. Presently the carriage stopped. She looked up. It was stopped by Mr. and Mrs. Weston, who were standing to speak to her. There was instant pleasure in the sight of them, and still greater pleasure was conveyed in sound, for Mr. Weston immediately accosted her with, "'How do you do? How do you do? We have been sitting with your father. Glad to see him so well. Frank comes to-morrow. I had a letter this morning. We see him to-morrow by dinner-time to a certainty. He is at Oxford to-day, and he comes for a whole fortnight. I knew it would be so. If he had come at Christmas, he could not have stayed three days. I was always glad he did not come at Christmas. Now we are going to have just the right weather for him— fine, dry, settled weather. We shall enjoy him completely. Everything has turned out exactly as we could wish. There was no resisting such news, no possibility of avoiding the influence of such a happy face as Mr. Weston's, confirmed, as it all was, by the words and the countenance of his wife, fewer and quieter, but not less to the purpose. To know that she thought his coming certain was enough to make Emma consider it so, and sincerely did she rejoice in their joy." It was a most delightful reanimation of exhausted spirits. The worn-out past was sunk in the freshness of what was coming, and in the rapidity of half a moment's thought she hoped Mr. Elton would now be talked of no more. Mr. Weston gave her the history of the engagements at Enscombe, which allowed his son to answer for having an entire fortnight at his command, as well as the route and method of his journey, and she listened and smiled and congratulated. "'I shall soon bring him over to Hartfield,' said he at the conclusion." Emma could imagine she saw a touch of the arm at his speech, from his wife. "'We had better move on, Mr. Weston,' said she. "'We are detaining the girls.' "'Well, well, I am ready, and turning again to Emma. But you must not be expecting such a very fine young man. You have only had my account, you know. I dare say he is really nothing extraordinary.' Though his own sparkling eyes at the moment were speaking a very different conviction. Emma could look perfectly unconscious and innocent, and answer in a manner that appropriated nothing. "'Think of me to-morrow, my dear Emma, about four o'clock,' was Mrs. Weston's parting injunction, spoken with some anxiety, and meant only for her. Four o'clock! Depend upon it he will be here by three, was Mr. Weston's quick amendment, and so ended a most satisfactory meeting. Emma's spirits were mounted quite up to happiness. Everything wore a different air. James and his horses seemed not half so sluggish as before. 
When she looked at the hedges, she thought the elder, at least, must soon be coming out, and when she turned round to Harriet, she saw something like a look of spring, a tender smile, even there. "'Will Mr. Frank Churchill pass through Bath as well as Oxford?' was a question, however, which did not augur much. But neither geography nor tranquillity could come all at once, and Emma was now in a humour to resolve that they should both come in time." The morning of the interesting day arrived, and Mrs. Weston's faithful pupil did not forget, either at ten, or eleven, or twelve o'clock, that she was to think of her at four. "'My dear, dear, anxious friend,' said she, in mental soliloquy, while walking downstairs from her own room, "'always over-careful for everybody's comfort but your own. I see you now in all your little fidgets, going again and again into his room, to be sure that all is right.' The clock struck twelve as she passed through the hall. "'Tis twelve. I shall not forget to think of you four hours hence, and by this time to-morrow, perhaps, or a little later, I may be thinking of the possibility of their all calling here. I am sure they will bring him soon." She opened the parlour door, and saw two gentlemen sitting with her father, Mr. Weston and his son. They had been arrived only a few minutes, and Mr. Weston had scarcely finished his explanation of Frank's being a day before his time and her father was yet in the midst of his very civil welcome and congratulations, when she appeared, to have her share of surprise, introduction, and pleasure. The Frank Churchill, so long talked of, so high in interest, was actually before her. He was presented to her, and she did not think too much had been said in his praise. He was a very good-looking young man. Height, air, address, all were unexceptionable, and his countenance had a great deal of the spirit and liveliness of his father's, he looked quick and sensible. She felt immediately that she should like him, and there was a well-bred ease of manner, and a readiness to talk, which convinced her that he came intending to be acquainted with her, and that acquainted they soon must be. He had reached Randall's the evening before. She was pleased with the eagerness to arrive which had made him alter his plan, and travel earlier, later, and quicker, that he might gain half a day. "'I told you yesterday,' cried Mr. Weston, with exultation, "'I told you all that he would be here before the time name. "'I remembered what I used to do myself. "'One cannot creep upon a journey, "'one cannot help getting on faster than one has planned, "'and the pleasure of coming in upon one's friends "'before the lookout begins "'is worth a great deal more than any little exertion it needs. "'It is a great pleasure where one can indulge in it,' said the young man, though there are not many houses that I should presume on so far, but in coming home I felt I might do anything. The word home made his father look on him with fresh complacency. Emma was directly sure that he knew how to make himself agreeable. The conviction was strengthened by what followed. He was very much pleased with Randall's, thought it a most admirably arranged house, would hardly allow it even to be very small, admired the situation, the walk to Highbury, Highbury itself, Hartfield still more, and professed himself to have always felt the sort of interest in the country which none but one's own country gives, and the greatest curiosity to visit it. That he should never have been able to indulge so amiable a feeling before, passed suspiciously through Emma's brain, but still, if it were a falsehood, it was a pleasant one, and pleasantly handled. His manner had no air of study or exaggeration. He did really look and speak as if in a state of no common enjoyment. Their subjects in general were such as belonged to an opening acquaintance. On his side were the inquiries. Was she a horsewoman? Pleasant rides? Pleasant walks? Had they a large neighbourhood? Highbury, perhaps, afforded society enough? There were several very pretty houses in and about it. Balls? Had they balls? Was it a musical society? But when satisfied on all these points, and their acquaintance proportionably advanced, he contrived to find an opportunity, while their two fathers were engaged with each other, of introducing his mother-in-law, and speaking of her with so much handsome praise, so much warm admiration, so much gratitude for the happiness she secured to his father, and her very kind reception to himself, as was an additional proof of his knowing how to please, and of his certainly thinking it worth while to try to please her. He did not advance a word of praise beyond what she knew to be thoroughly deserved by Mrs. Weston, but undoubtedly he could know very little of the matter. He understood what would be welcome. He could be sure of little else. His father's marriage, he said, had been the wisest measure. Every friend must rejoice in it, and the family from whom he had received such a blessing must be ever considered as having conferred the highest obligation on him. 
he got as near as he could to thanking her for Miss Taylor's merits, without seeming quite to forget that in the commonest course of things it was to be rather supposed that Miss Taylor had formed Miss Woodhouse's character than Miss Woodhouse Miss Taylor's. And at last, as if resolved to qualify his opinion completely for travelling round its object, he wound it all up with astonishment at the youth and beauty of her person. "'Elegant, agreeable manners I was prepared for,' said he, "'but I confess that, considering everything, I had not expected more than a very tolerably well-looking woman of a certain age. I did not know that I was to find a pretty young woman in Mrs. Weston.' "'You cannot see too much perfection in Mrs. Weston for my feelings,' said Emma. "'Were you to guess her to be eighteen, I should listen with pleasure. But she would be ready to quarrel with you for using such words. Don't let her imagine that you have spoken of her as a pretty young woman.' "'I hope I should know better,' he replied. "'No, depend upon it,' with a gallant bow, "'that in addressing Mrs. Weston I should understand whom I might praise without any danger of being thought extravagant in my terms.' Emma wondered whether the same suspicion of what might be expected from their knowing each other, which had taken a strong possession of her mind, had ever crossed his, and whether his compliments were to be considered as marks of acquiescence, or proofs of defiance. She must see more of him to understand his ways. At present she only felt they were agreeable. She had no doubt of what Mr. Weston was often thinking about. His quick eye she detected again and again glancing towards them, with a happy expression, and even when he might have determined not to look, she was confident that he was often listening. Her own father's perfect exemption from any thought of the kind, the entire deficiency in him of all such sort of penetration or suspicion, was a most comfortable circumstance. Happily he was not farther from approving matrimony than from foreseeing it. Though always objecting to every marriage that was arranged, he never suffered beforehand from the apprehension of any— it seemed as if he could not think so ill of any two persons' understanding as to suppose they meant to marry, till it were proved against them. She blessed the favouring blindness. He could now, without the drawback of a single unpleasant surmise, without a glance forward at any possible treachery in his guest, give way to all his natural, kind-hearted civility in solicitous inquiries after Mr. Frank Churchill's accommodation on his journey, through the sad evils of sleeping two nights on the road, and expressed very genuine, unmixed anxiety to know that he had certainly escaped catching cold, which, however, he could not allow him to feel quite assured of himself till after another night. A reasonable visit paid, Mr. Weston began to move. He must be going. He had business at the Crown about his hay, and a great many errands for Mrs. Weston at Ford's, but he need not hurry anybody else. His son, too well-bred to hear the hint, rose immediately also, saying, "'As you are going farther on business, sir, I will take the opportunity of paying a visit, which must be paid some day or other, and therefore may as well be paid now. I have the honour of being acquainted with a neighbour of yours,' turning to Emma, "'a lady residing in or near Highbury, a family of the name of Fairfax. I shall have no difficulty, I suppose, in finding the house, though Fairfax, I believe, is not the proper name.' I should rather say Barnes or Bates. Do you know any family of that name? To be sure we do, cried his father. Mrs. Bates, we passed her house. I saw Miss Bates at the window. True, true, you are acquainted with Miss Fairfax. I remember you knew her at Weymouth, and a fine girl she is. Call upon her, by all means. There is no necessity for my calling this morning, said the young man. Another day would do as well. But there was that degree of acquaintance at Weymouth which— "'Oh, go to-day, go to-day. Do not defer it. What is right to be done cannot be done too soon. And besides, I must give you a hint, Frank. Any want of attention to her here should be carefully avoided. You saw her with the Campbells when she was the equal of everybody she mixed with, but here she is with a poor old grandmother, who has barely enough to live on. If you do not call early, it will be a slight.' The son looked convinced. "'I have heard her speak of the acquaintance,' said Emma. "'She is a very elegant young woman.' He agreed to it, but with so quiet a yes as inclined her almost to doubt his real concurrence, and yet there must be a very distinct sort of elegance for the fashionable world, if Jane Fairfax could be thought only ordinarily gifted with it. "'If you were never particularly struck by her manners before,' said she, "'I think you will to-day. You will see her to advantage, see her and hear her. No, I am afraid you will not hear her at all, for she has an aunt who never holds her tongue. You are acquainted with Miss Fairfax, sir, are you?' said Mr. Woodhouse, always the last to make his way in conversation, then give me leave to assure you that you will find her a very agreeable young lady. She is staying here on a visit to her grandmamma and aunt, 
very worthy people. I have known them all my life. They will be extremely glad to see you, I am sure, and one of my servants shall go with you to show you the way. My dear sir, upon no account in the world, my father can direct me. But your father is not going so far. He is only going to the crown, quite on the other side of the street, and there are a great many houses. You might be very much at a loss, and it is a very dirty walk, unless you keep on the footpath, but my coachman can tell you where you had best cross the street." Mr. Frank Churchill still declined it, looking as serious as he could, and his father gave his hearty support by calling out, "'My good friend, that is quite unnecessary. Frank knows a puddle of water when he sees it, and as to Mrs. Bates, he may get there from the crown in a hop, step, and a jump.' They were permitted to go alone, and with a cordial nod from one, and a graceful bow from the other, the two gentlemen took leave. Emma remained very well pleased with this beginning of the acquaintance, and could now engage to think of them all at Randall's any hour of the day with full confidence in their comfort. End of Volume 2, Chapter 5 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume 2, Chapter 6 of Emma by Jane Austen Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain the next morning brought Mr. Frank Churchill again. He came with Mrs. Weston, to whom, and to Highbury, he seemed to take very cordially. He had been sitting with her, it appeared, most companionably at home, till her usual hour of exercise, and on being desired to choose their walk, immediately fixed on Highbury. He did not doubt there being very pleasant walks in every direction, but if left to him, he should always choose the same. Highbury, that airy, cheerful, happy-looking Highbury, would be his constant attraction. Highbury, with Mrs. Weston, stood for Hartfield, and she trusted to its bearing the same construction with him. They walked thither directly. Emma had hardly expected them, for Mr. Weston, who had called in for half a minute, in order to hear that his son was very handsome, knew nothing of their plans, and it was an agreeable surprise to her, therefore, to perceive them walking up to the house together, arm in arm. She was wanting to see him again, and especially to see him in company with Mrs. Weston, upon his behaviour to whom her opinion of him was to depend. If he were deficient there, nothing should make amends for it. But on seeing them together, she became perfectly satisfied. It was not merely in fine words, or hyperbolical compliment, that he paid his duty. Nothing could be more proper or pleasing than his whole manner to her. Nothing could more agreeably denote his wish of considering her as a friend, and securing her affection." and there was time enough for Emma to form a reasonable judgment, as their visit included all the rest of the morning. They were all three walking about together for an hour or two, first round the shrubberies of Hartfield, and afterwards in Highbury. He was delighted with everything, admired Hartfield sufficiently for Mr. Woodhouse's ear, and when their going farther was resolved on, confessed his wish to be made acquainted with the whole village, and found matter of commendation and interest much oftener than Emma could have supposed. Some of the objects of his curiosity spoke very amiable feelings. He begged to be shown the house which his father had lived in so long, and which had been the home of his father's father, and on recollecting that an old woman who nursed him was still living, walked in quest of her cottage from one end of the street to the other, and though in some points of pursuit or observation there was no positive merit, they showed altogether a good will towards Highbury in general, which must be very like a merit to those he was with. Emma watched and decided that, with such feelings as were now shown, it could not be fairly supposed that he had been ever voluntarily absenting himself, that he had not been acting a part or making a parade of insincere professions, and that Mr. Knightley certainly had not done him justice. Their first pause was at the Crown Inn, an inconsiderable house, though the principal one of the sort, where a couple of pair of post-horses were kept, more for the convenience of the neighbourhood than from any run on the road, and his companions had not expected to be detained by any interest excited there, but in passing it they gave the history of the large room visibly added. It had been built, many years ago, for a ballroom, and while the neighbourhood had been in a particularly populous dancing state, had been occasionally used as such. But such brilliant days had long passed away, and now the highest purpose for which it was ever wanted was to accommodate a whist-club, established among the gentlemen and half-gentlemen of the place." He was immediately interested. Its character as a ballroom caught him, and instead of passing on, he stopped for several minutes at the two superior sashed windows which were open, to
to look in and contemplate its capabilities, and lament that its original purpose should have ceased. He saw no fault in the room. He would acknowledge none which they suggested. No, it was long enough, broad enough, handsome enough. It would hold the very number for comfort. They ought to have balls there at least every fortnight through the winter. Why had not Miss Woodhouse revived the former good old days of the room? She, who could do anything in Highbury, the want of proper families in the place, and the conviction that none beyond the place and its immediate environs could be tempted to attend, were mentioned, but he was not satisfied. He could not be persuaded that so many good-looking houses as he saw around him could not furnish numbers enough for such a meeting, and even when particulars were given and families described, he was still unwilling to admit that the inconvenience of such a mixture would be anything, or that there would be the smallest difficulty in everybody's returning to their proper place the next morning. He argued like a young man very much bent on dancing, and Emma was rather surprised to see the constitution of the Weston prevail so decidedly against the habits of the Churchills. He seemed to have all the life and spirit, cheerful feelings, and social inclinations of his father, and nothing of the pride or reserve of Enscombe. Of pride, indeed, there was, perhaps, scarcely enough. His indifference to a confusion of rank bordered too much on inelegance of mind. He could be no judge, however, of the evil he was holding cheap. It was but an effusion of lively spirits. At last he was persuaded to move on from the front of the crown, and being now almost facing the house where the Bateses lodged, Emma recollected his intended visit the day before, and asked him if he had paid it. "'Oh, yes, yes,' he replied. "'I was just going to mention it. A very successful visit. I saw all the three ladies, and felt very much obliged to you for your preparatory hint. If the talking aunt had taken me quite by surprise, it must have been the death of me. As it was, I was only betrayed into paying a most unreasonable visit.' Ten minutes would have been all that was necessary, perhaps all that was proper, and I had told my father I should certainly be at home before him. But there was no getting away, no pause, and to my utter astonishment I found, when he, finding me nowhere else, joined me there at last, that I had been actually sitting with them very nearly three-quarters of an hour. The good lady had not given me the possibility of escape before. And how did you think Miss Fairfax looking? Ill, very ill. That is, if a young lady can ever be allowed to look ill. But the expression is hardly admissible, Mrs. Weston, is it? Ladies can never look ill. And, seriously, Miss Fairfax is naturally so pale, as almost always to give the appearance of ill health, a most deplorable want of complexion. Emma would not agree to this, and began a warm defence of Miss Fairfax's complexion. It was certainly never brilliant, but she would not allow it to have a sickly hue in general and there was a softness and delicacy in her skin which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face. He listened, with all due deference, acknowledged that he had heard many people say the same, but yet he must confess that to him nothing could make amends for the want of the fine glow of health. Where the features were indifferent, a fine complexion gave beauty to them all, and where they were good, the effect was, fortunately, he need not attempt to describe what the effect was. Well, said Emma, there is no disputing about taste. At least you admire her, except her complexion. He shook his head and laughed. I cannot separate Miss Fairfax and her complexion. Did you see her often at Weymouth? Were you often in the same society? At this moment they were approaching Ford's, and he hastily exclaimed, Ha! Huh, this must be the very shop that everybody attends every day of their lives, as my father informs me. He comes to Highbury himself, he says, six days out of the seven, and has always business at Ford's. If it be not inconvenient to you, pray let us go in, that I may prove myself to belong to the place, to be a true citizen of Highbury. I must buy something at Ford's. It will be taking out my freedom. I dare say they sell gloves. Oh, yes, gloves and everything. I do admire your patriotism. You will be adored in Highbury. You were very popular before you came, because you were Mr. Weston's son, but lay out half a guinea at Ford's, and your popularity will stand upon your own virtues. They went in, and while the sleek, well-tied parcels of men's beavers and York tan were bringing down and displaying on the counter, he said, "'But I beg your pardon, Miss Woodhouse, you were speaking to me. You were saying something at the very moment of this burst of my amour patriotie. Do not let me lose it. I assure you the utmost stretch of public fame would not make amends for the loss of any happiness in private life. I merely asked whether you had known much of Miss Fairfax and her party at Weymouth. 
and now that I understand your question, I must pronounce it to be a very unfair one. It is always the lady's right to decide on the degree of acquaintance. Miss Fairfax must already have given her account. I shall not commit myself by claiming more than she may choose to allow. Upon my word, you answer as discreetly as she could do herself. But her account of everything leaves so much to be guessed. She is so very reserved, so very unwilling to give the latest information about anybody, that I really think you may say what you like of your acquaintance with her. May I, indeed? Then I will speak the truth, and nothing suits me so well. I met her frequently at Weymouth. I had known the Campbells a little in town, and at Weymouth we were very much in the same set. Colonel Campbell is a very agreeable man, and Mrs. Campbell a friendly, warm-hearted woman. I like them all. You know Miss Fairfax's situation in life, I conclude, what she is destined to be? Yes, rather hesitatingly. I believe I do. You get upon delicate subjects, Emma, said Mrs. Weston, smiling. Remember that I am here. Mr. Frank Churchill hardly knows what to say when you speak of Miss Fairfax's situation in life. I will move a little farther off. I certainly do forget to think of her, said Emma, as having ever been anything but my friend, and my dearest friend. He looked as if he fully understood and honoured such a sentiment. When the gloves were bought, and they had quitted the shop again, "'Did you ever hear the young lady we were speaking of play?' said Frank Churchill. "'Ever hear her?' repeated Emma. "'You forget how much she belongs to Highbury. I have heard her every year of our lives since we both began. She plays charmingly.' "'You think so, do you? I wanted the opinion of someone who could really judge. She appeared to me to play well, that is, with considerable taste, but I know nothing of the matter myself. I am excessively fond of music, but without the smallest skill or right of judging anybody's performance. I have been used to hear hers admired, and I remember one proof of her being thought to play well. A man, a very musical man, and in love with another woman, engaged to her, on the point of marriage, would yet never ask that other woman to sit down to the instrument, if the lady in question could sit down instead. Never seemed to like to hear one if he could hear the other. That, I thought, in a man of known musical talent, was some proof. "'Proof, indeed,' said Emma, highly amused. "'Mr. Dixon is very musical, is he? "'We shall know more about them all in half an hour from you "'than Miss Fairfax would have vouchsafed in half a year. "'Yes, Mr. Dixon and Miss Campbell were the persons, "'and I thought it a very strong proof. "'Certainly. Very strong it was, to own the truth, "'a great deal stronger than, if I had been Miss Campbell, "'would have been at all agreeable to me. "'I could not excuse a man's having more music than love.' more ear than I, a more acute sensibility to fine sounds than to my feelings. How did Miss Campbell appear to like it? It was her very particular friend, you know. Poor comfort, said Emma, laughing. One would rather have a stranger preferred than one's very particular friend. With a stranger it might not recur again, but the misery of having a very particular friend always at hand, to do everything better than one does oneself. Poor Mrs. Dixon! Well, I am glad she has gone to settle in Ireland." "'You're right. It was not very flattering to Miss Campbell, but she really did not seem to feel it. "'So much the better, or so much the worse, I do not know which. "'But be it sweetness or be it stupidity in her, quickness of friendship or dullness of feeling, "'there was one person, I think, who must have felt it, Miss Fairfax herself. "'She must have felt the improper and dangerous distinction. "'As to that, I do not—oh, do not imagine that I expect an account of Miss Fairfax's sensations from you—' or from anybody else. They are known to no human being, I guess, but herself. But if she continued to play whenever she was asked by Mr. Dixon, one may guess what one chooses. There appeared such a perfectly good understanding among them all, he began rather quickly, but checking himself, added, however, it is impossible for me to say on what terms they really were, how it might all be behind the scenes. I can only say that there was a smoothness outwardly. But you, who have known Miss Fairfax from a child, must be a better judge of her character, and how she is likely to conduct herself in critical situations, than I can be. I have known her from a child, undoubtedly. We have been children and women together, and it is natural to suppose that we should be intimate, that we should have taken to each other whenever she visited her friends. But we never did. I hardly know how it has happened, a little, perhaps, from that wickedness on my side which was prone to take disgust towards a girl so idolized and so cried up as she always was, by her aunt and grandmother and all their set. And then her reserve. I never could attach myself to one so completely reserved. 
"'It is a most repulsive quality, indeed,' said he. "'Oftentimes very convenient, no doubt, but never pleasing. "'There is safety in reserve, but no attraction. "'One cannot love a reserved person. "'Not till the reserve ceases towards oneself, "'and then the attraction may be the greater. "'But I must be more in want of a friend, "'or an agreeable companion, than I have yet been, "'to take the trouble of conquering anybody's reserve to procure one. "'Intimacy between Miss Fairfax and me is quite out of the question.' I have no reason to think ill of her, not the least, except that such extreme and perpetual cautiousness of word and manner, such a dread of giving a distinct idea about anybody, is apt to suggest suspicions of there being something to conceal. He perfectly agreed with her, and after walking together so long, and thinking so much alike, Emma felt herself so well acquainted with him, that she could hardly believe it to be only their second meeting. He was not exactly what she had expected— less of the man of the world in some of his notions, less of the spoiled child of fortune, and therefore better than she had expected. His ideas seemed more moderate, his feelings warmer. She was particularly struck by his manner of considering Mr. Elton's house, which, as well as the church, he would go and look at, and would not join them in finding fault with. No, he could not believe it a bad house, not such a house as a man was to be pitied for having. If it were to be shared with the woman he loved, he could not think any man to be pitied for having that house. There must be ample room in it for every real comfort. The man must be a blockhead who wanted more. Mrs. Weston laughed, and said he did not know what he was talking about. Used only to a large house himself, and without ever thinking how many advantages and accommodations were attached to its size, he could be no judge of the privations inevitably belonging to a small one. But Emma, in her own mind, determined that he did know what he was talking about, and that he showed a very amiable inclination to settle early in life, and to marry, from worthy motives. He might not be aware of the inroads on domestic peace to be occasioned by no housekeeper's room, or a bad butler's pantry, but, no doubt, he did perfectly feel that Enscombe would not make him happy, and that whenever he were attached, he would willingly give up much of wealth to be allowed an early establishment." End of Volume 2, Chapter 6, read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 7 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day, by hearing that he was gone off to London merely to have his hair cut. A sudden freak seemed to have seized him at breakfast, and he had sent for a chaise and sent off, intending to return to dinner, but with no more important view that appeared than having his hair cut. There was certainly no harm in his travelling sixteen miles twice over on such an errand, but there was an air of foppery and nonsense in it which she could not approve. It did not accord with the rationality of plan, the moderation in expense, or even the unselfish warmth of heart which she had believed herself to discern in him yesterday. Vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper, which must be doing something, good or bad, heedlessness as to the pleasure of his father and Mrs. Weston, indifferent as to how his conduct might appear in general, he became liable to all those charges. His father only called him a coxcomb, and thought it a very good story, but that Mrs. Weston did not like it was clear enough, by her passing it over as quickly as possible, and making no other comment than— all young people would have their little whims. With the exception of this little blot, Emma found that his visit hitherto had given her friends only good ideas of him. Mrs. Weston was very ready to say how attentive and pleasant a companion he made himself, how much she saw to like in his disposition altogether. He appeared to have a very open temper, certainly a very cheerful and lively one. She could observe nothing wrong in his notions, a great deal decidedly right, he spoke of his uncle with warm regard, was fond of talking of him, said he would be the best man in the world if he were left to himself, and, though there were no being attached to the aunt, he acknowledged her kindness with gratitude, and seemed to mean always to speak of her with respect. This was all very promising, and, but for such an unfortunate fancy for having his hair cut, there was nothing to denote him unworthy of the distinguished honour which her imagination had given him the honour, if not of being really in love with her, of being at least very near it, and saved only by her own indifference, for still her resolution held of never marrying, 
the honour, in short, of being marked out for her by all their joint acquaintance. Mr. Weston, on his side, added a virtue to the account which must have some weight. He gave her to understand that Frank admired her extremely, thought her very beautiful and very charming, and, with so much to be said for him altogether, she found she must not judge him harshly. As Mrs. Weston observed, all young people would have their little whims. There was one person among his new acquaintance in Surrey not so leniently disposed. In general he was judged, throughout all the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, with great candour, liberal allowances were made for the little excesses of such a handsome young man, one who smiled so often and bowed so well, but there was one spirit among them not to be softened, from its power of censure, by bows or smiles, Mr. Knightley. The circumstance was told him at Hartfield. For the moment he was silent, but Emma heard him almost immediately afterwards say to himself, over a newspaper he held in his hand, "'Hm! just the trifling, silly fellow I took him for.' She had half a mind to resent, but an instant's observation convinced her that it was really said only to relieve his own feelings, and not meant to provoke, and therefore she let it pass. Although in one instance the bearers of not good tidings, Mr. and Mrs. Weston's visit this morning was in another respect particularly opportune. Something occurred while they were at Hartfield to make Emma want their advice, and, which was still more lucky, she wanted exactly the advice they gave. This was the occurrence. The Coles had been settled some years in Highbury, and were a very good sort of people, friendly, liberal, and unpretending, but, on the other hand, they were of low origin, in trade, and only moderately genteel. On their first coming into the country they had lived in proportion to their income, quietly, keeping little company, and that little inexpensively. But the last year or two had brought them a considerable increase of means, the house in town had yielded greater profits, and fortune in general had smiled on them. With their wealth their views increased, their want of a larger house, their inclination for more company. They added to their house, to their number of servants, to their expenses of every sort, and by this time were, in fortune and style of living, second only to the family at Hartfield. Their love of society, and their new dining-room, prepared everybody for their keeping dinner company, and a few parties, chiefly among the single men, had already taken place. The regular and best families Emma could hardly suppose they would presume to invite, neither Donwell, nor Hartfield, nor Randalls. Nothing should tempt her to go if they did, and she regretted that her father's known habits would be giving her refusal less meaning than she could wish. The Coles were very respectable in their way, but they ought to be taught that it was not for them to arrange the terms on which the superior families would visit them. This lesson, she very much feared, they would receive only from herself. She had little hope of Mr. Knightley, none of Mr. Weston. But she had made up her mind how to meet this presumption so many weeks before it appeared, that when the insult came at last, it found her very differently affected. Donwell and Randalls had received their invitation, and none had come for her father and herself, and Mrs. Weston's accounting for it with, I suppose they will not take the liberty with you, they know you do not dine out, was not quite sufficient. She felt that she should like to have had the power of refusal, and afterwards, as the idea of the party to be assembled there, consisting precisely of those whose society was dearest to her, occurred again and again, she did not know that she might not have been tempted to accept. Harriet was to be there in the evening, and the Bateses. They had been speaking of it as they walked about Highbury the day before, and Frank Churchill had most earnestly lamented her absence. Might not the evening end in a dance? It had been a question of his. The bare possibility of it acted as a further irritation on her spirits, and her being left in solitary grandeur, even supposing the omission to be intended as a compliment, was but poor comfort. It was the arrival of this very invitation, while the Westons were at Hartfield, which made their presence so acceptable, for though her first remark, on reading it, was that of course it must be declined, she so very soon proceeded to ask them what they advised her to do, that their advice for her going was most prompt and successful. She owned that, considering everything, she was not absolutely without inclination for the party. The Coles expressed themselves so properly, there was so much real attention in the manner of it, so much consideration for her father. They would have solicited the honour earlier, but had been waiting the arrival of a folding screen from London, which they hoped might keep Mr. Woodhouse from any draught of air, and therefore induce him the more readily to give them the honour of his company. 
On the whole she was very persuadable, and it being briefly settled among themselves how it might be done without neglecting his comfort, how certainly Mrs. Goddard, if not Mrs. Bates, might be depended on for bearing him company, Mr. Woodhouse was to be talked into an acquiescence of his daughter's going out to dinner on a day now near at hand, and spending the whole evening away from him. As for his going, Emma did not wish him to think it possible. The hours would be too late, and the party too numerous. He was soon pretty well resigned. "'I am not fond of dinner-visiting,' said he. "'I never was. No more is Emma. Late hours do not agree with us. I am sorry Mr. and Mrs. Cole should have done it. I think it would be much better if they would come in one afternoon next summer, and take their tea with us, take us in their afternoon walk, which they might do, as our hours are so reasonable, and yet get home without being out in the damp of the evening.' The dews of a summer evening are what I would not expose anybody to. However, as they are so very desirous to have dear Emma dine with them, and as you will both be there, and Mr. Knightley too, to take care of her, I cannot wish to prevent it, providing the weather to be what it ought, neither damp, nor cold, nor windy. Then turning to Mrs. Weston, with a look of gentle reproach, "'Ah, Miss Taylor, if you had not married, you would have stayed at home with me.' "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'as I took Miss Taylor away, it is incumbent on me to supply her place, if I can, and I will step to Mrs. Goddard in a moment, if you wish it.' But the idea of anything to be done in a moment was increasing, not lessening, Mr. Woodhouse's agitation. The ladies knew better how to allay it. Mr. Weston must be quiet, and everything deliberately arranged. With this treatment Mr. Woodhouse was soon composed enough for talking as usual. He should be happy to see Mrs. Goddard, he had a great regard for Mrs. Goddard, and Emma should write a line and invite her. James could take the note. But first of all there must be an answer written to Mrs. Cole. "'You will make my excuses, my dear, as civilly as possible. You will say that I am quite an invalid and go nowhere, and therefore must decline their obliging invitation, beginning with my compliments, of course. But you will do everything right. I need not tell you what is to be done. We must remember to let James know that the carriage will be wanted on Tuesday.' I shall have no fears for you with him. We have never been there above once since the new approach was made, but still I have no doubt that James will take you very safely. And when you get there, you must tell him at what time you would have him come for you again, and you had better name an early hour. You will not like staying late. You will get very tired when tea is over. But you would not wish me to come away before I am tired, papa. Oh, no, my love, but you will soon be tired. There will be a great many people talking at once." you will not like the noise. "'But, my dear sir,' cried Mr. Weston, "'if Emma comes away early, it will be breaking up the party.' "'And no great harm if it does,' said Mr. Woodhouse. "'The sooner every party breaks up, the better. "'But you do not consider how it may appear to the coals. "'Emma's going away directly after tea might be giving offence. "'They are good-natured people, and think little of their own claims. "'But still they must feel that anybody's hurrying away is no great compliment, and Miss Woodhouse's doing it would be more thought of than any other person's in the room. You would not wish to disappoint and mortify the Coles. I am sure, sir, friendly, good sort of people as ever lived, and who have been your neighbours these ten years. No, upon no account in the world, Mr. Weston, I am much obliged to you for reminding me. I should be extremely sorry to be giving them any pain. I know what worthy people they are. Perry tells me that Mr. Cole never touches malt liquor. You would not think it to look at him, but he is bilious. Mr. Cole is very bilious. No, I would not be the means of giving them any pain. My dear Emma, we must consider this. I am sure, rather than run the risk of hurting Mr. and Mrs. Cole, you would stay a little longer than you might wish. You will not regard being tired. You will be perfectly safe, you know, among your friends. Oh, yes, papa, I have no fears at all for myself. I should have no scruples of staying late as Mrs. Weston and I should have no scruples of staying as late as Mrs. Weston, but on your account. I am only afraid of your sitting up for me. I am not afraid of your not being exceedingly comfortable with Mrs. Goddard. She loves piquet, you know, but when she has gone home, I am afraid you will be sitting up by yourself, instead of going to bed at your usual time. The idea of that would entirely destroy my comfort. You must promise me not to sit up. He did, on the condition of some promises on her side, such as that, if she came home cold, she would be sure to warm herself thoroughly, if hungry, that she would take something to eat, that her own maid should sit up for her, and that Searle and the butler should see that everything were safe in the house, as usual. End of Volume 2 Chapter 7 Read by Sibella Denton 
For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Two, Chapter Eight of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Frank Churchill came back again, and if he kept his father's dinner waiting, it was not known at Hartfield, for Mrs. Weston was too anxious for his being a favourite with Mr. Woodhouse to betray any imperfection which could be concealed. He came back, had had his hair cut, and laughed at himself with a very good grace, but without seeming really at all ashamed of what he had done. He had no reason to wish his hair longer, to conceal any confusion of face, no reason to wish the money unspent to improve his spirits. He was quite as undaunted and as lively as ever, and after seeing him Emma thus moralized to herself, "'I do not know whether it ought to be so, but certainly silly things do cease to be silly if they are done by sensible people in an impudent way. Wickedness is always wickedness, but folly is not always folly. It depends upon the character of those who handle it. Mr. Knightley, he is not a trifling, silly young man. If he were, he would have done this differently. He would have either gloried in the achievement or been ashamed of it. There would have been either the ostentation of a coxcomb or the evasions of a mind too weak to defend its own vanities. No, I am perfectly sure that he is not trifling or silly. With Tuesday came the agreeable prospect of seeing him again, and for a longer time than hitherto, of judging of his general manners, and by inference of the meaning of his manners towards herself, of guessing how soon it might be necessary for her to throw a coldness into her air, and of fancying what the observations of all those might be, who were now seeing them together for the first time. She meant to be very happy, in spite of the scene being laid at Mr. Cole's, and without being able to forget that among the failings of Mr. Elton, even in the days of his favour, none had disturbed her more than his propensity to dine with Mr. Cole. Her father's comfort was amply secured, Mrs. Bates as well as Mrs. Goddard being able to come, and her last pleasing duty, before she left the house, was to pay her respects to them as they sat together after dinner, and while her father was fondly noticing the beauty of her dress, to make the two ladies all the amends in her power, by helping them to large slices of cake and full glasses of wine, for whatever unwilling self-denial his care of their constitution might have obliged them to practice during the meal. She had provided a plentiful dinner for them. She wished she could know that they had been allowed to eat it. She followed another carriage to Mr. Cole's door, and was pleased to see that it was Mr. Knightley's, for Mr. Knightley, keeping no horses, having little spare money and a great deal of health, activity, and independence, was too apt, in Emma's opinion, to get about as he could, and not use his carriage so often as became the owner of Donwell Abbey. She had an opportunity now of speaking her approbation while warm from her heart, for he stepped to hand her out. "'This is coming as you should do,' said she, like a gentleman. "'I am quite glad to see you.' He thanked her, observing, how lucky that we should arrive in the same moment, for if we had met first in the drawing-room, I doubt whether you would have discerned me to be more of a gentleman than usual. You might not have distinguished how I came, by my look or manner. Yes, I should, I am sure I should. There was always a look of consciousness or bustle when people come in a way which they know to be beneath them. You think you carry it off very well, I dare say, but with you it is a sort of bravado, an air of affected unconcern. I always observe it whenever I meet you under those circumstances. Now you have nothing to try for. You are not afraid of being supposed ashamed. You are not striving to look taller than anybody else. Now I shall really be very happy to walk into the same room with you. Nonsensical girl, was his reply, but not at all in anger. Emma had as much reason to be satisfied with the rest of the party as with Mr. Knightley. She was received with a cordial respect which could not but please and given all the consequence she could wish for. When the Westons arrived, the kindest looks of love, the strongest of admiration, were for her, both from husband and wife. The son approached her with a cheerful eagerness which marked her as his peculiar object, and at dinner she found him seated by her, and as she firmly believed, not without some dexterity on his side. The party was rather large, as it included one other family, a proper, unexceptionable country family, whom the Coles had the advantage of naming among their acquaintance, and the male part of Mr. Cox's family, the lawyer of Highbury. 
the less worthy females were to come in the evening with Miss Bates, Miss Fairfax, and Miss Smith, but already at dinner they were too numerous for any subject of conversation to be general, and while politics and Mr. Elton were talked over, Emma could fairly surrender all her attention to the pleasantness of her neighbour. The first remote sound to which she felt herself obliged to attend was the name of Jane Fairfax. Mrs. Cole seemed to be relating something of her that was expected to be very interesting. She listened, and found it well worth listening to. That very dear part of Emma, her fancy, received an amusing supply. Mrs. Cole was telling that she had been calling on Miss Bates, and as soon as she entered the room had been struck by the sight of a pianoforte, a very elegant-looking instrument, not a grand, but a large-sized square pianoforte, and the substance of the story, the end of all the dialogue which ensued of surprise and inquiry and congratulations on her side, and explanations on Miss Bates's, was that this pianoforte had arrived from Broadwoods the day before, to the great astonishment of both aunt and niece, entirely unexpected, that at first, by Miss Bates's account, Jane herself was quite at a loss, quite bewildered to think who could have possibly ordered it, but now they were both perfectly satisfied that it could be from only one quarter, of course it must be from Colonel Campbell. One can suppose nothing else, added Mrs. Cole, and I was only surprised that there could have ever been a doubt. But Jane, it seems, had a letter from them very lately, and not a word was said about it. She knows their ways best, but I should not consider their silence as any reason for their not meaning to make the present. They might choose to surprise her. Mrs. Cole had many to agree with her. Everybody who spoke on the subject was equally convinced that it must come from Colonel Campbell, and equally rejoiced that such a present had been made, and there were enough ready to speak to allow Emma to think her own way, and still listen to Mrs. Cole. I declare I do not know when I have heard anything that has given me more satisfaction. It has always quite hurt me that Jane Fairfax, who plays so delightfully, should not have an instrument. It seemed quite a shame, especially considering how many houses there are where fine instruments are absolutely thrown away. This is like giving ourselves a slap, to be sure, and it was but yesterday I was telling Mr. Cole I really was ashamed to look at our new grand pianoforte in the drawing-room, while I do not know one note from another, and our little girls, who are but just beginning, perhaps may never make anything of it. And there is poor Jane Fairfax, who is mistress of music, has not anything of the nature of an instrument, not even the pitifullest old spinet in the world, to amuse herself with. I was saying this to Mr. Cole but yesterday, and he quite agreed with me, only he is so particularly fond of music that he could not help indulging himself in the purchase, hoping that some of our good neighbours might be so obliging, occasionally, to put it to better use than we can, and that really is the reason why the instrument was bought, or else I am sure we ought to be ashamed of it. We are in great hopes that Miss Woodhouse may be prevailed with to try it this evening. Miss Woodhouse made the proper acquiescence, and finding that nothing more was to be entrapped from any communication of Mrs. Cole's, turned to Frank Churchill. "'Why do you smile?' said she. "'Nay, why do you?' "'Me! I suppose I smile for pleasure at Colonel Campbell's being so rich and so liberal. It is a handsome present.' "'Very. I rather wonder that it was never made before.' "'Perhaps Miss Fairfax has never been staying here so long before. "'Or that he did not give her the use of their own instrument, "'which must now be shut up in London, untouched by anybody. "'That is a grand pianoforte, and he might think it too large for Mrs. Bates's house. "'You may say what you choose, but your countenance testifies "'that your thoughts on this subject are very much like mine. "'I do not know. I rather believe you are giving me more credit for acuteness than I deserve.' I smile because you smile, and shall probably suspect whatever I find you suspect, but at present I do not see what there is to question. If Colonel Campbell is not the person, who can be? What do you say to Mrs. Dixon? Mrs. Dixon, very true indeed. I had not thought of Mrs. Dixon. She must know, as well as her father, how acceptable an instrument would be, and perhaps the mode of it, the mystery, the surprise, is more like a young woman's scheme than an elderly man's. It is Mrs. Dixon, I dare say. I told you that your suspicions would guide mine. If so, you must extend your suspicions and comprehend Mr. Dixon in them. Mr. Dixon? Very well. Yes, I immediately perceived that it must be the joint present of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon. We were speaking the other day, you know, of his being so warm an admirer of her performance. Yes, and what you told me on that head confirmed an idea which I had entertained before. 
I do not mean to reflect upon the good intentions of either Mr. Dixon or Miss Fairfax, but I cannot help suspecting either that, after making his proposals to her friend, he had the misfortune to fall in love with her, or that he became conscious of a little attachment on her side. One might guess twenty things without guessing exactly the right, but I am sure there must be a particular cause for her choosing to come to Highbury, instead of going with the Campbells to Ireland. Here she must be leading a life of privation and penance. There it would have been all enjoyment. As to the pretense of trying her native air, I look upon that as a mere excuse. In the summer it might have passed. But what can anybody's native air do for them in the months of January, February, and March? Good fires and carriages would be much more to the purpose in most cases of delicate health, and I dare say in hers. I do not require you to adopt all my suspicions, though you may make so noble a profession of doing it, but I honestly tell you what they are. And upon my word, they have an air of great probability. Mr. Dixon's preference of her music to her friends I can answer for being very decided. And then he saved her life. Did you ever hear of that? A water-party, and by some accident she was falling overboard. He caught her. He did. I was there, one of the party. Were you really? Well— but if you observed nothing, of course, for it seems to be a new idea to you, if I had been there, I think I should have made some discoveries. I dare say you would. But I, simple I, saw nothing but the fact that Miss Fairfax was nearly dashed from the vessel, and that Mr. Dixon caught her. It was the work of a moment. Although the consequent shock and alarm was very great, and much more durable, indeed I believe it was half an hour before any of us were comfortable again, yet that was too general a sensation for anything of peculiar anxiety to be observable. I do not mean to say, however, that you might not have made discoveries. The conversation was here interrupted. They were called on to share in the awkwardness of a rather long interval between the courses, and obliged to be as formal and orderly as the others, but when the table was again safely covered, and occupation and ease were generally restored, Emma said, "'The arrival of this pianoforte is decisive with me,' I wanted to know a little more, and this tells me quite enough. Depend upon it, we shall soon hear that it is a present from Mr. and Mrs. Dixon. And if the Dixons should absolutely deny all knowledge of it, we must conclude it to come from the Campbells. No, I am sure it is not from the Campbells. Miss Fairfax knows it is not from the Campbells, or they would have been guessed at first. She would not have been puzzled had she dared fix on them. I may not have convinced you, perhaps, but I am perfectly convinced myself that Mr. Dixon is a principal in the business. Indeed, you injure me if you suppose me unconvinced. Your reasonings carry my judgment along with them entirely. At first, while I supposed you satisfied that Colonel Campbell was the giver, I saw it only as paternal kindness, and thought it the most natural thing in the world. But when you mentioned Mrs. Dixon, I felt how much more probable that it should be the tribute of warm female friendship." and now I can see it in no other light than as an offering of love. There was no real occasion to press the matter farther. The conviction seemed real, he looked as if he felt it. She said no more, other subjects took their turn, and the rest of the dinner passed away. The dessert succeeded, the children came in, and were talked to and admired amid the usual rate of conversion. A few clever things said, a few downright silly, but by much the larger proportion, neither the one nor the other— nothing worse than everyday remarks, dull repetitions, old news, and heavy jokes. The ladies had not been long in the drawing-room before the other ladies, in their different divisions, arrived. Emma watched the entree of her own particular little friend, and if she could not exult in her dignity and grace, she could not only love the blooming sweetness and the artless manner, but could most heartily rejoice in that light, cheerful, unsentimental disposition which allowed her so many alleviations of pleasure, in the midst of the pangs of disappointed affection. There she sat, and who would have guessed how many tears she had been lately shedding? To be in company, nicely dressed herself, and seeing others nicely dressed, to sit and smile and look pretty, and say nothing, was enough for the happiness of the present hour. Jane Fairfax did look and move superior, but Emma suspected she might have been glad to change feelings with Harriet, very glad to have purchased the mortification of having loved, yes, of having loved even Mr. Elton in vain, by the surrender of all the dangerous pleasure of knowing herself beloved by the husband of her friend. In so large a party it was not necessary that Emma should approach her. She did not wish to speak of the pianoforte. She felt too much in the secret herself, to think the appearance of a curiosity or interest fair, and therefore purposefully kept at a distance. 
but by the other the subject was almost immediately introduced, and she saw the blush of consciousness with which congratulations were received, the blush of guilt which accompanied the name of my excellent friend, Colonel Campbell. Mrs. Weston, kind-hearted and musical, was particularly interested by the circumstance, and Emma could not help being amused at her perseverance in dwelling on the subject, and having so much to ask, and to say, as to tone, touch, and pedal, totally unsuspicious of that wish of saying as little about it as possible, which she plainly read in the fair heroine's countenance. They were soon joined by some of the gentlemen, and the very first of the early was Frank Churchill. In he walked, the first and the handsomest, and after paying his compliments en passant to Miss Bates and her niece, made his way directly to the opposite side of the circle, where sat Miss Woodhouse, and, till he could find a seat by her, would not sit at all. Emma divined what everybody present must be thinking. She was his object, and everybody must perceive it. She introduced him to her friend, Miss Smith, and at convenient moments afterwards heard what each thought of the other. He had never seen a face so lovely, and was delighted with her naivete. And she, only to be sure that it was paying him too great a compliment, but she did think there were some looks a little like Mr. Elton. Emma restrained her indignation, and only turned from her in silence. Smiles of intelligence passed between her and the gentleman on first glancing towards Miss Fairfax, but it was most prudent to avoid speech. He told her that he had been impatient to leave the dining-room, hated sitting long, was always the first to move when he could, that his father, Mr. Knightley, Mr. Cox, and Mr. Cole were left very busy over parish business, that as long as he had stayed, however, it had been pleasant enough, as he had found them, in general, a set of gentlemanlike, sensible men, and spoke so handsomely of Highbury altogether, thought it so abundant in agreeable families, that Emma began to feel she had been used to despise the place rather too much. She questioned him as to the society in Yorkshire, the extent of the neighbourhood about Enscombe and the sort, and he could make out from his answers that, as far as Enscombe was concerned, there was very little going on, that their visitings were among a range of great families, none very near, and that even when days were fixed, and invitations accepted, it was an even chance that Mrs. Churchill were not in health and spirits for going, that they made a point of visiting no fresh person, and that though he had his separate engagements, it was not without difficulty, without considerable address at times, that he could get away, or introduce an acquaintance for a night. She saw that Enscombe could not satisfy, and that Highbury, taken at its best, might reasonably please a young man who had more retirement at home than he liked. His importance at Enscombe was very evident. He did not boast, but it naturally betrayed itself, that he had persuaded his aunt where his uncle could do nothing, and on her laughing and noticing it, he owned that he believed, excepting one or two points, he could with time persuade her to anything. One of those points on which his influence failed, he then mentioned. He had wanted very much to go abroad, had been very eager indeed to be allowed to travel, but she would not hear of it. This had happened the year before. Now, he said, he was beginning to have no longer the same wish. The unpersuadable point, which he did not mention, Emma guessed to be good behaviour to his father. "'I have made a most wretched discovery,' he said, after a short pause. "'I have been here a week to-morrow, half my time. I never do days fly so fast. A week to-morrow, and I have hardly begun to enjoy myself. But just got acquainted with Mrs. Weston and others. I hate the recollection.' "'Perhaps you may now begin to regret that you spent one whole day out of so few in having your hair cut.' "'No,' said he, smiling, "'that is no subject of regret at all. I have no pleasure in seeing my friends unless I can believe myself fit to be seen.' The rest of the gentlemen being now in the room, Emma found herself obliged to turn from him for a few minutes, and listen to Mr. Cole. When Mr. Cole had moved away, and her attention could be restored as before, she saw Frank Churchill looking intently across the room at Miss Fairfax, who was sitting exactly opposite. "'What is the matter?' said she. He started. "'Thank you for rousing me,' he replied. "'I believe I have been very rude. But really, Miss Fairfax has done her hair in so odd a way, so very odd a way, that I cannot keep my eyes from her. I never saw anything so outré. Those curls! This must be a fancy of her own. I see nobody else looking like her. I must go and ask her whether it is an Irish fashion. Shall I?' "'Yes, I will, I declare I will, and you shall see how she takes it, whether she colours. He was gone immediately, and Emma saw him standing before Miss Fairfax, and talking to her, 
but as to its effect on the young lady, he had improvidently placed himself exactly between them, exactly in front of Miss Fairfax. She could absolutely distinguish nothing. Before he could return to his chair, it was taken by Mrs. Weston. "'This is the luxury of a large party,' said she. "'One can get near everybody and say everything. "'My dear Emma, I am longing to talk to you. "'I have been making discoveries and forming plans, just like yourself, "'and I must tell them why the idea is fresh. "'Do you know how Miss Bates and her niece came here? "'How? They were invited, were not they? "'Oh, yes, but how they were conveyed hither, the manner of their coming. "'They walked, I conclude. How else could they come? "'Very true.' "'Well, a little while ago it occurred to me how very sad it would be to have Jane Fairfax walking home again, late at night, and cold as the nights are now. And as I looked at her, though I never saw her appear more to advantage, it struck me that she was heated, and would therefore be particularly liable to take cold. Poor girl! I could not bear the idea of it, so as soon as Mr. Weston came into the room, and I could get at him, I spoke to him about the carriage. You may guess how readily he came into my wishes— and having his approbation, I made my way directly to Miss Bates, to assure her that the carriage would be at her service before it took us home, for I thought it would be making her comfortable at once. Good soul! She was as grateful as possible, you may be sure. Nobody was ever so fortunate as herself, but with many, many thanks, there was no occasion to trouble us, for Mr. Knightley's carriage had brought, and was to take them home again. I was quite surprised, very glad, I am sure, but really quite surprised, such a very kind attention, and so thoughtful an attention, the sort of thing that so few men would think of. And, in short, from knowing his usual ways, I am very much inclined to think that it was for their accommodation the carriage was used at all. I do suspect he would not have had a pair of horses for himself, and that it was only as an excuse for assisting them. "'Very likely,' said Emma, "'nothing more likely. I know no man more likely than Mr. Knightley to do the sort of thing, to do anything really good-natured, useful, considerate, or benevolent. He is not a gallant man, but he is a very humane one, and this, considering Jane Fairfax's ill health, would appear a case of humanity to him. For an act of unostentatious kindness there is nobody whom I would fix on more than on Mr. Knightley. I know he had horses to-day, for we arrived together, and I laughed at him about it, but he said not a word that could betray." Well, said Mrs. Weston, smiling, you give him credit for more simple, disinterested benevolence in this instance than I do, for while Miss Bates was speaking, a suspicion darted into my head, and I have never been able to get it out again. The more I think of it, the more probable it appears. In short, I have made a match between Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax. See the consequence of keeping you company? What do you say to it? "'Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax!' exclaimed Emma. "'Dear Mrs. Weston, how could you think of such a thing? "'Mr. Knightley! Mr. Knightley must not marry. "'You would not have little Henry cut out from Donwell. "'Oh, no, no, Henry must have Donwell. "'I cannot at all consent to Mr. Knightley's marrying, "'and I am sure it is not at all likely. "'I am amazed that you should think of such a thing. "'My dear Emma, I have told you what led me to think it.' I do not want the match, I do not want to injure dear little Henry, but the idea has been given me by circumstances, and if Mr. Knightley really wished to marry, you would not have him refrain on Henry's account, a boy of six years old who knows nothing of the matter. Yes, I would. I could not bear to have Henry supplanted. Mr. Knightley, marry. No, I have never had such an idea, and I cannot adopt it now. And Jane Fairfax, too, of all women— "'Nay, she has always been a first favourite with him, as you very well know. "'But the imprudence of such a match! "'I am not speaking of its prudence, merely its probability. "'I see no probability in it, unless you have any better foundation than what you mention. "'His good nature, his humanity, as I tell you, would be quite enough to account for the horses. "'He has a great regard for the Bateses, you know, independent of Jane Fairfax, "'and is always glad to show them any attention.' My dear Mrs. Weston, do not take to matchmaking. You do it very ill. Jane Fairfax, mistress of the Abbey. Oh, no, no, every feeling revolts. For his own sake, I would not have him do so mad a thing. Imprudent, if you please, but not mad. Excepting inequality of fortune, and perhaps a little disparity of age, I can see nothing unsuitable. But Mr. Knightley does not want to marry. I am sure he has not the least idea of it. Do not put it into his head. Why should he marry? He is as happy as possible by himself, with his farm, and his sheep, and his library, and all the parish to manage, and he is extremely fond of his brother's children. 
He has no occasion to marry, either to fill up his time or his heart. My dear Emma, as long as he thinks so, it is so. But if he really loves Jane Fairfax— Nonsense! He does not care about Jane Fairfax. In the way of love, I am sure he does not. He would do any good to her, or her family, but— well, said Mrs. Weston, laughing, perhaps the greatest good he could do them would be to give Jane such a respectable home. If it would be good to her, I am sure it would be evil to himself, a very shameful and degrading connection. How would he be able, how would he bear to have Miss Bates belonging to him, to have her haunting the Abbey and thanking him all day long for his great kindness in marrying Jane? So very kind and obliging. But he always had been such a very kind neighbor and then fly off through half a sentence to her mother's old petticoat. Not that it was such a very old petticoat, either, for still it would last a great while, and indeed she must thankfully say that their petticoats were all very strong. For shame, Emma, do not mimic her. You divert me against my conscience. And upon my word I do not think Mr. Knightley would be much disturbed by Miss Bates. Little things do not irritate him. She might talk on, and if he wanted to say anything himself he would only talk louder and drown her voice. But the question is not whether it would be a bad connection for him, but whether he wishes it, and I think he does. I have heard him speak, and so must you, so very highly of Jane Fairfax. The interest he takes in her, his anxiety about her health, his concern that she should have no happier prospect. I have heard him express himself so warmly on those points. Such an admirer of her performance on the pianoforte, and of her voice. I have heard him say that he could listen to her for ever. Oh, and I had almost forgotten one idea that occurred to me. This pianoforte that has been sent here by somebody, though we have all been so well satisfied to consider it a present from the Campbells, may it not be a present from Mr. Knightley? I cannot help suspecting him. I think he is just the person to do it, even without being in love. Then it can be no argument to prove that he is in love. But I do not think it is at all likely a thing for him to do. Mr. Knightley does nothing mysteriously." I have heard him lamenting her having no instrument repeatedly, oftener than I should suppose such a circumstance would, in the common course of things, occur to him. Very well, and if he had intended to give her one, he would have told her so. There might be scruples of delicacy, my dear Emma. I have a very strong notion that it comes from him. I am sure he was particularly silent when Mrs. Cole told us of it at dinner. You take up an idea, Mrs. Weston, and run away with it, as you have many a times reproached me with doing. I see no sign of attachment, I believe nothing of the pianoforte, and proof only shall convince me that Mr. Knightley has any thought of marrying Jane Fairfax. They combated the point some time longer in the same way, Emma rather gaining ground over the mind of her friend, for Mrs. Weston was the most used of the two to yield, till a little bustle in the room showed them that tea was over, and the instrument in preparation, and at the same moment Mr. Cole approaching to entreat Miss Woodhouse would do them the honour of trying it. Frank Churchill, of whom, in the eagerness of her conversation with Mrs. Weston, she had been seeing nothing, except that he had found a seat by Miss Fairfax, followed Mr. Cole, to add his very pressing entreaties, and as in every respect it suited Emma best to lead, she gave a very proper compliance. She knew the limitations of her own powers too well to attempt more than she could perform with credit. She wanted neither taste nor spirit in the little things which are generally acceptable, and could accompany her own voice well. One accompaniment to her song took her agreeably by surprise, a second, slightly but correctly taken by Frank Churchill. Her pardon was duly begged at the close of the song, and everything usual followed. He was accused of having a delightful voice, and a perfect knowledge of music, which was properly denied, and that he knew nothing of the matter, and had no voice at all, roundly asserted. They sang together once more, and Emma would then resign her place to Miss Fairfax, whose performance, both vocal and instrumental, she could never attempt to conceal from herself, was infinitely superior to her own. With mixed feelings, she seated herself at a little distance from the numbers round the instrument to listen. Frank Churchill sang again. They had sung together once or twice, it appeared, at Weymouth. But the sight of Mr. Knightley among the most attentive soon drew away half Emma's mind, and she fell into a train of thinking on the subject of Mrs. Weston's suspicions, to which the sweet sounds of the united voices gave only momentary interruptions. Her objections to Mr. Knightley's marrying did not in the least subside. She could see nothing but evil in it. It would be a great disappointment to Mr. John Knightley, consequently to Isabella. 
a real injury to the children, a most mortifying change, and a material loss to them all, a very great deduction from her father's daily comfort, and as to herself, she could not at all endure the idea of Jane Fairfax at Donwell Abbey. A Mrs. Knightley for them all to give way to. No, Mr. Knightley must never marry. Little Henry must remain the heir of Donwell. Presently Mr. Knightley looked back, and came and sat down by her. They talked at first only of the performance. His admiration was certainly very warm, yet she thought, but for Mrs. Weston, it would not have struck her. As a sort of touchstone, however, she began to speak of his kindness in conveying the aunt and niece, and, though his answer was in the spirit of cutting the matter short, she believed it to indicate only his disinclination to dwell on any kindness of his own. "'I often feel concerned,' said she, "'that I dare not make our carriage more useful on such occasions. It is not that I am without the wish, but you know how impossible my father would deem it that James should be put to for such a purpose.' "'Quite out of the question, quite out of the question,' he replied. "'But you must often wish it, I am sure.' And he smiled, with such seeming pleasure at the conviction, that she must proceed another step. "'This present from the Campbell,' said she, "'this pianoforte is very kindly given.' "'Yes,' he replied, and without the smallest apparent embarrassment. "'But they would have done better had they given her notice of it. Surprises are foolish things. The pleasure is not enhanced, and the inconvenience is often considerable.' I should have expected better judgment in Colonel Campbell. From that moment Emma could have taken her oath that Mr. Knightley had no concern in giving the instrument. But whether he were entirely free from peculiar attachment, whether there were no actual preference, remained a little longer doubtful. Towards the end of Jane's second song her voice grew thick. "'That will do,' said he, when it was finished, thinking aloud. "'You have sung quite enough for one evening. Now be quiet.' Another soon, however, was soon begged for. One more, they would not fatigue Miss Fairfax on any account, and would only ask for one more. And Frank Churchill was heard to say, I think you could manage this without effort. The first part is so very trifling. The strength of the song falls on the second. Mr. Knightley grew angry. That fellow, said he indignantly, thinks of nothing but showing off his own voice. This must not be. And touching Miss Bates, who at that moment passed near, Miss Bates, are you mad to let your niece sing herself hoarse in this manner? Go and interfere. They have no mercy on her. Miss Bates, in her real anxiety for Jane, could hardly stay even to be grateful, before she stepped forward and put an end to all farther singing. Here ceased the concert part of the evening, for Miss Woodhouse and Miss Fairfax were the only young lady performers. But soon, within five minutes, the proposal of dancing, originating nobody exactly knew where, was so effectually promoted by Mr. and Mrs. Cole that everything was rapidly clearing away, to give proper space. Mrs. Weston, capital in her country dances, was seated, and beginning an irresistible waltz, and Frank Churchill, coming up with most becoming gallantry to Emma, had secured her hand, and led her to the top. While waiting till the other young couple could pair themselves off, Emma found time, in spite of the compliments she was receiving on her voice and her taste, to look about and see what became of Mr. Knightley. This would be a trial. He was no dancer in general." If he were to be very alert in engaging Jane Fairfax now, it might augur something. There was no immediate appearance. No, he was talking to Mrs. Cole, he was looking on unconcerned, Jane was asked by somebody else, and he was still talking to Mrs. Cole. Emma had no longer an alarm for Henry. His interest was yet safe, and she let off the dance with genuine spirit and enjoyment. Not more than five couple could be mustered, but the rarity and the suddenness of it made it very delightful, and she found herself well matched in a partner. They were a couple worth looking at. Two dances, unfortunately, were all that could be allowed. It was growing late, and Miss Bates became anxious to get home, on her mother's account. After some attempts, therefore, to be permitted to begin again, they were obliged to thank Mrs. Weston, look sorrowful, and have done. "'Perhaps it is well,' said Frank Churchill, as he attended Emma to her carriage. "'I must have asked Miss Fairfax, and her languid dancing would not have agreed with me, after yours.' End of Volume 2, Chapter 8, read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 9 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Emma did not repent her condescension in going to the Coles. The visit afforded her many pleasant recollections the next day, and all that she might be supposed to have lost on the side of dignified seclusion must be amply repaid in the splendour of popularity. 
She must have delighted the Coles, worthy people who deserved to be made happy, and left a name behind her that would not soon die away. Perfect happiness, even in memory, is not common, and there were two points on which she was not quite easy. She doubted whether she had not transgressed the duty of a woman by woman in betraying her suspicions of Jane Fairfax's feelings to Frank Churchill. It was hardly right, but it had been so strong an idea that it would escape her, and his submission to all that she told was a compliment to her penetration, which made it difficult for her to be quite certain that she ought to have held her tongue. The other circumstance of regret related also to Jane Fairfax. She did unfeignedly and unequivocally regret the inferiority of her own playing and singing. She did most heartily grieve over the idleness of her childhood, and sat down and practised vigorously an hour and a half. She was then interrupted by Harriet's coming in, and if Harriet's praise could have satisfied her, she might soon have been comforted. "'Oh, if I could but play as well as you and Miss Fairfax!' "'Don't class us together, Harriet. My playing is no more like hers than a lamp is like sunshine.' "'Oh, dear, I think you play the best of the two. I think you play quite as well as she does. I am sure I had much rather hear you. Everybody said last night how well you played.' Those who knew anything about it must have felt the difference. The truth is, Harriet, that my playing is just good enough to be praised, but Jane Fairfax's is much beyond it. "'Well, I always shall think that you play quite as well as she does, or that, if there is any difference, nobody would ever find it out. Mr. Cole said how much taste you had, and Mr. Frank Churchill talked a great deal about your taste, and that he valued taste much more than execution. "'Ah, but Jane Fairfax has them both, Harriet.' "'Are you sure? I saw she had execution, but I did not know she had any taste. Nobody talked about it. And I hate Italian singing. There is no understanding a word of it.' Besides, if she does play so very well, you know, it is no more than she is obliged to do, because she will have to teach. The Coxes were wondering last night whether she would get into any great family. How did you think the Coxes looked? Just as they always do. Very vulgar. They told me something, said Harriet, rather hesitatingly, but it is nothing of any consequence. Emma was obliged to ask what they had told her, though fearful of its producing Mr. Elton. They told me— that Mr. Martin dined with them last Saturday. Oh! He came to their father upon some business, and he asked him to stay to dinner. Oh! They talked a great deal about him, especially Anne Cox. I do not know what she meant, but she asked me if I thought I should go and stay there again next summer. She meant to be impertinently curious, just as such an Anne Cox should be. She said he was very agreeable the day he dined there. He sat by her at dinner. Miss Nash thinks either of the Coxes would be very glad to marry him. "'Very likely. I think they are, without exception, the most vulgar girls in Highbury. Harriet had business at Ford's. Emma thought it most prudent to go with her. Another accidental meeting with the Martins was possible, and in her present state would be dangerous. Harriet, tempted by everything and swayed by half a word, was always very long at a purchase, and while she was still hanging over muslins and changing her mind, Emma went to the door for amusement. Much could not be hoped from the traffic of even the busiest part of Highbury— Mr. Perry walking hastily by, William Cox letting himself in at the office door, Mr. Cole's carriage-horses returning from exercise, or a stray letter-boy on an obstinate mule, were the liveliest objects she could presume to expect, and when her eyes fell only on the butcher with his tray, a tidy old woman travelling homewards from a shop with her full basket, two curs quarrelling over a dirty bone, and a string of dwaddling children round the baker's little bow-window eyeing the gingerbread, she knew she had no reason to complain, and was amused enough, quite enough still to stand at the door. A mind lively and at ease can do with seeing nothing, and can see nothing that does not answer. She looked down the Randalls Road. The scene enlarged, two persons appeared, Mrs. Weston and her son-in-law. They were walking into Highbury, to Hartfield, of course. They were stopping, however, in the first place at Mrs. Bates's, whose house was a little nearer Randalls than Ford's, and had all but knocked when Emma caught their eye. Immediately they crossed the road and came forward to her, and the agreeableness of yesterday's engagement seemed to give fresh pleasure to the present meeting. Mrs. Weston informed her that she was going to call on the Bateses, in order to hear the new instrument. "'For my companion tells me,' said she, "'that I absolutely promised Miss Bates last night that I would come this morning. I was not aware of it myself. I did not know that I had fixed a day, but, as he says I did, I am going now. And while Mrs. Weston pays her visit, I may be allowed, I hope,' said Frank Churchill, to join your party and wait for her at Hartfield, if you are going home. 
Mrs. Weston was disappointed. "'I thought you meant to go with me. They would be very much pleased. Me? I should be quite in the way. But perhaps I may be equally in the way here. Miss Woodhouse looks as if she did not want me. My aunt always sends me off when she is shopping. She says I fidget her to death, and Miss Woodhouse looks as if she could almost say the same. What am I to do?' "'I am here on no business of my own,' said Emma. "'I am only waiting for my friend. She will probably have soon done, and then we shall go home. But you had better go with Mrs. Weston and hear the instrument. Well, if you advise it, but, with a smile, if Colonel Campbell should have employed a careless friend, and if it should prove to have an indifferent tone, what shall I say? I shall be no support to Mrs. Weston. She might do very well by herself. A disagreeable truth would be palatable through her lips, but I am the wretchedest being in the world at a civil falsehood. "'I do not believe any such thing,' replied Emma. "'I am persuaded that you can be as insincere as your neighbours when it is necessary, but there is no reason to suppose the instrument is indifferent. Quite otherwise, indeed, if I understood Miss Fairfax's opinion last night.' "'Do come with me,' said Mrs. Weston, "'if it be not very disagreeable to you. It need not detain us long. We will go to Hartfield afterward. We will follow them to Hartfield. I really wish you to call with me.' It will be felt so great an attention, and I always thought you meant it. He could say no more, and, with the hope of Hartfield to reward him, returned with Mrs. Weston to Mrs. Bates's door. Emma watched them in, and then joined Harriet at the interesting counter, trying, with all the force of her own mind, to convince her that if she wanted plain muslin it was of no use to look at figured, and that a blue ribbon, be it ever so beautiful, would still never match her yellow pattern. At last it was all settled, even to the destination of the parcel. "'Should I send it to Mrs. Goddard's, ma'am?' asked Mrs. Ford. "'Yes, no, yes, to Mrs. Goddard's. Only my pattern-gown is at Hartfield. No, you shall send it to Hartfield, if you please. But then Mrs. Goddard will want to see it, and I could take the pattern-gown home any day. But I shall want the ribbon directly, so it had better go to Hartfield, at least the ribbon. You could make it into two parcels, Mrs. Ford, could you not?' "'It is not worth while, Harriet, to give Mrs. Ford the trouble of two parcels. No more it is.' "'No trouble in the world, ma'am,' said the obliging Mrs. Ford. "'Oh, but, indeed, I would much rather have it only in one. Then, if you please, you shall send it all to Mrs. Goddard's. I do not know—no, I think, Miss Woodhouse, I may just as well have it sent to Hartfield, and take it home with me at night. What do you advise? That you do not give another half-second to the subject. To Hartfield, if you please, Mrs. Ford.' "'Aye, that will be much best,' said Harriet, quite satisfied. "'I should not at all like to have it sent to Mrs. Goddard's. Voices approached the shop, or rather one voice and two ladies. Mrs. Weston and Miss Bates met them at the door. "'My dear Miss Woodhouse,' said the latter, "'I am just run across to entreat the favour of you to come and sit down with us a little while, and give us your opinion of our new instrument, you and Miss Smith. How do you do, Miss Smith? Very well, I thank you, and I begged Mrs. Weston to come with me, that I might be sure of succeeding. I hope Mrs. Bates and Miss Fairfax are very well. I am much obliged to you. My mother is delightfully well, and Jane caught no cold last night. How is Mr. Woodhouse? I am so glad to hear such a good account. Mrs. Weston told me you were here. Oh, then, said I, I must run across. I am sure Miss Weston will allow me to just run across and entreat her to come in. My mother would be so very happy to see her, and now we are in such a party she cannot refuse. I pray do, said Mr. Frank Churchill. Miss Woodhouse's opinion of the instrument will be worth having. But, said I, I shall be more sure of succeeding if one of you will go with me. Oh, said he, wait half a minute till I have finished my job. For would you believe it, Miss Woodhouse, there he is, in the most obliging manner in the world, fastening in the rivet of my mother's spectacles. The rivet came out, you know, this morning, so very obliging, for my mother had no use of her spectacles, could not put them on. And, by the by, everybody ought to have two pairs of spectacles. They should, indeed. Jane said so. I meant to take them over to John Saunders the first thing I did, but something or other hindered me all the morning. First one thing, then another. There is no saying what, you know. At one time Patty came to say she thought the kitchen chimney needed sweeping. Oh, said I, Patty, do not come with your bad news to me. Here is the rivet of your mistress's spectacles out. Then the baked apples came home. Mrs. Wallace sent them by her boy. They are extremely civil and obliging to us, the Wallaces, always. I have heard some people say that Mrs. Wallace can be uncivil and give a very rude answer, but we have never known anything but the greatest attention from them. And it cannot be for the value of our custom now, for what is our consumption of bread, you know? Only three of us, besides dear Jane at present, and she really eats nothing, makes such a shocking breakfast you would be quite frightened if you saw it. 
I dare not let my mother know how little she eats, so I say one thing, and then I say another, and it passes off. But about the middle of the day she gets hungry, and there is nothing she likes so well as these baked apples, and they are extremely wholesome, for I took the opportunity the other day of asking Mr. Perry. I happened to meet him in the street. Not that I had any doubt before. I have so often heard Mr. Woodhouse recommend a baked apple. I believe it is the only way that Mr. Woodhouse thinks the fruit thoroughly wholesome. We have apple dumplings, however, very often. Patty makes an excellent apple dumpling. Well, Mrs. Weston, you have prevailed, I hope, and these ladies will oblige us. Emma would be very happy to wait on Mrs. Bates, etc., and they did at last move out of the shop, with no farther delay from Miss Bates than, "'How do you do, Mrs. Ford? I beg your pardon. I did not see you before. I hear you have a charming collection of new ribbons from town. Jane came back, delighted, yesterday. Thank you. The gloves do very well. Only a little too large about the wrist, but Jane is taking them in.' "'What was I talking of?' said she, beginning again when they were all in the street. Emma wondered on what, of all the medley, she would fix. "'I declare I cannot recollect what I was talking of. Oh, my mother's spectacles! So very obliging of Mr. Frank Churchill! Oh, said he, I do think I can fasten the rivet. I like a job of this kind excessively. Which, you know, showed him to be so very—' Indeed, I must say that, much as I had heard of him before, and much as I had expected, he very far exceeds anything— I do congratulate you, Mrs. Weston, most warmly. He seems everything the fondest parent could— Oh, said he, I can fasten the ribbit. I like a job of that sort excessively. I shall never forget his manner. And when I brought out the baked apples from the closet, and hoped our friends would be so very obliging as to take some, Oh, said he directly, there is nothing in the way of fruit half so good, and these are the finest-looking home-baked apples I ever saw in my life. That, you know, is so very— And I am sure by his manner it was no compliment— Indeed, they are very delightful apples, and Mrs. Wallace does them full justice, only we do not have them baked more than twice, and Mr. Woodhouse made us promise to have them done three times, but Miss Woodhouse will be so good as not to mention it. The apples themselves are the very finest sort for baking, beyond a doubt, all from Donwell, some of Mr. Knightley's most liberal supply. He sends us a sack every year, and certainly there never was such a keeping apple anywhere as one of his trees. I believe there is two of them." My mother says the orchard was always famous in her younger days. But I was really quite shocked the other day, for Mr. Knightley called one morning, and Jane was eating these apples, and we talked about them, and said how much she enjoyed them, and he asked whether we were not got to the end of our stock. "'I am sure you must be,' said he, "'and I will send you another supply, for I have a great many more than I can ever use. William Larkins let me keep a larger quantity than usual this year. I will send you some more, before they get good for nothing.' So I begged he would not, for really, as to ours being gone, I could not absolutely say that we had a great many left. It was but half a dozen indeed, but they should all be kept for Jane, and I could not at all bear that he should be sending us more, so liberal as he had been already, and Jane said the same. And when he was gone she almost quarrelled with me. No, I should not say quarrelled, for we never had a quarrel in our lives, but she was quite distressed that I had owned the apples were so nearly gone. She wished I had made him believe we had a great many left." "'Oh,' said I, my dear, I did as much as I could. However, the very same evening William Larkins came over with a large basket of apples, the same sort of apples, a bushel at least, and I was very much obliged, and went down and spoke to William Larkins, and said everything as you may suppose. William Larkins is such an old acquaintance. I am always glad to see him. But, however, I found afterwards from Patty that William said it was all the apples of that sort the master had. He had brought them all, and now his master had not one left to bake or boil.' William did not seem to mind it himself, he was so pleased to think his master had sold so many, for William, you know, thinks more of his master's profit than anything, but Mrs. Hodges, he said, was quite displeased at their being all sent away. She could not bear that her master should not be able to have another apple tart this spring. He told Patty this, but bid her not to mind it, and to be sure not to say anything to us about it, for Mrs. Hodges would be cross sometimes, and as long as so many sacks were sold it did not signify who ate the remainder— and so Patty told me, and I was excessively shocked indeed. I would not have Mr. Knightley know anything about it for the world. He would be so very—I wanted to keep it from James' knowledge, but unluckily I had mentioned it before I was aware. Mrs. Bates had just done as Patty opened the door, and her visitors walked upstairs without having any regular narration to attend to, pursued only by the sounds of her dulcetory goodwill. "'Pray take care, Mrs. Weston, there is a step at the turning. Pray take care, Miss Woodhouse, ours is rather a dark staircase.' rather darker and narrower than one could wish. Miss Smith, pray take care. Miss Woodhouse, I am quite concerned. I am sure you hit your foot. Miss Smith, the step at the turning. End of Volume 2, Chapter 9 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org
of you guys. Volume Two, Chapter Ten of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. The appearance of the little sitting room as they entered was tranquillity itself. Mrs. Bates, deprived of her usual employment, slumbering on one side of the fire. Frank Churchill, at a table near her, most deedily occupied about her spectacles, and Jane Fairfax, standing with her back to them, intent on her pianoforte. Busy as he was, however, the young man was yet able to show a most happy countenance on seeing Emma again. "'This is a pleasure,' said he, in rather a low voice, "'coming at least ten minutes earlier than I had calculated. You find me trying to be useful. Tell me if you think I shall succeed.' what said mrs weston have you not finished it yet you would not earn a very good livelihood as a working silversmith at this rate i have not been working uninterruptedly he replied i have been assisting miss fairfax in trying to make her instrument stand steady it was not quite firm an unevenness in the floor i believe you see we have been wedging one leg with paper this was very kind of you to be persuaded to come i was almost afraid you would be hurrying home he contrived that she should be seated by him, and was sufficiently employed in looking out the best bake apple for her, and trying to make her help or advise him in his work, till Jane Fairfax was quite ready to sit down to the pianoforte again. That she was not immediately ready, Emma did suspect to arise from the state of her nerves. She had not yet possessed the instrument long enough to touch it without emotion. She must reason herself into the power of performance, and Emma could not but pity such feelings, whatever their origin, and could not but resolve never to expose them to her neighbour again. At last Jane began, and, though the first bars were feebly given, the power of the instrument were gradually done full justice to. Mrs. Weston had been delighted before, and was delighted again. Emma joined her in all her praise, and the pianoforte, with every proper discrimination, was pronounced to be altogether of the highest promise. "'Whoever Colonel Campbell might employ,' said Frank Churchill, with a smile at Emma, "'the person has not chosen ill. I heard a good deal of Colonel Campbell's taste at Weymouth, and all the softness of the upper notes, I am sure, is exactly what he and all that party would particularly prize. I dare say, Miss Fairfax, that he either gave his friend very minute directions, or wrote to Broadwood himself. Do you not think so?' Jane did not look around. She was not obliged to hear. Mrs. Weston had been speaking to her at the same moment. "'It is not fair,' said Emma, in a whisper. "'Mine was a random guess. Do not distress her.' He shook his head with a smile, and looked as if he had very little doubt and very little mercy. Soon afterwards he began again. "'How much your friends in Ireland must be enjoying your pleasure on this occasion, Miss Fairfax. I dare say they often think of you, and wonder which will be the day, the precise day of the instruments coming to hand.' Do you imagine Colonel Campbell knows the business to be going forward just at this time? Do you imagine it to be the consequence of an immediate commission from him, or that he may have sent only a general direction, an order infinite as to time, to depend upon contingencies and conveniences? He paused. She could not but hear. She could not avoid answering. Till I have had a letter from Colonel Campbell, said she, in a voice of forced calmness, I can imagine nothing with any confidence. It must be all conjecture." conjecture. I sometimes one conjectures right, and sometimes one conjectures wrong. I wish I could conjecture how soon I shall make this rivet quite firm. What nonsense one talks, Miss Woodhouse, when hard at work, if one talks at all. Your real workmen, I suppose, hold their tongues, but we gentlemen labourers, if we get hold of a word. Miss Fairfax said something about conjecturing. There, it is done. I have the pleasure, madam, to Mrs. Bates, of restoring your spectacles, healed for the present." He was very warmly thanked by both mother and daughter. To escape a little from the latter, he went to the pianoforte, and begged Miss Fairfax, who was still sitting at it, to play something more. "'If you are very kind,' said he, "'it will be one of the waltzes we danced last night. Let me live them over again. You did not enjoy them as I did. You appeared tired the whole time. I believe you were glad we danced no longer, but I would have given worlds, all the worlds one ever has to give, for another half-hour.' She played. What felicity it is to hear a tune which has made one happy! If I mistake not, that was danced at Weymouth. She looked up at him for a moment, coloured deeply, and played something else. He took some music from a chair near the pianoforte, and, turning to Emma, said, Here is something quite new to me. Do you know it? Kramer. And here are a new set of Irish melodies. That, from such a quarter, one might expect. This was all sent with the instrument. Very thoughtful of Colonel Campbell, was it not? He knew Miss Fairfax could have no music here. 
I honour that part of the attention particularly. It shows it to have been so thoroughly from the heart. Nothing hastily done, nothing incomplete. True affection only could have prompted it. Emma wished he would be less pointed, yet could not help being amused, and when on glancing her eye towards Jane Fairfax she caught the remains of a smile, when she saw that, with all the deep blush of consciousness, there had been a smile of secret delight, she had less scruple in the amusement, and much less compunction with respect to her. This amiable, upright, perfect Jane Fairfax was apparently cherishing very reprehensible feelings. He brought all the music to her, and they looked it over together. Emma took the opportunity of whispering, "'You speak too plain. She must understand you.' "'I hope she does. I would have her understand me. I am not in the least ashamed of my meaning. But really, I am half ashamed, and wish I had never taken up the idea. I am very glad you did, and that you communicated it to me. I now have a key to all her odd looks and ways. Leave shame to her. If she does wrong, she ought to feel it. She is not entirely without it, I think. I do not see much sign of it. She is playing Robin Adair at this moment, his favourite. Shortly afterwards, Miss Bates, passing near the window, descried Mr. Knightley on horseback not far off. "'Mr. Knightley, I declare, I must speak to him, if possible, just to thank him. I will not open the window here. It would give you all cold. But I can go into my mother's room, you know. I dare say he will come in when he knows who is here. Quite delighted to have you all meet so. Our little room so honoured. She was in the adjoining chamber while she still spoke, and opening the casement there, immediately called Mr. Knightley's attention, and every syllable of their conversation was as distinctly heard by the others, as if it had passed within the same apartment. "'How do you do? How do you do? Very well, I thank you. So obliged to you for the carriage last night. We were just in time. My mother, just ready for us. Pray come in. Do come in. You will find some friends here.' So began Miss Bates, and Mr. Knightley seemed determined to be heard in his turn, for most resolutely and commandingly did he say, "'How is your niece, Miss Bates? I want to inquire after you all, but particularly your niece. How is Miss Fairfax? I hope she caught no cold last night. How is she to-day? Tell me how Miss Fairfax is.' And Miss Bates was obliged to give a direct answer before he would hear her in anything else. The listeners were amused, and Mrs. Weston gave Emma a look of particular meaning but Emma still shook her head in steady scepticism. "'So obliged to you, so very much obliged to you for the carriage,' resumed Miss Bates. He cut her short with, "'I'm going to Kingston. Can I do anything for you?' "'Oh, dear, Kingston, are you? Mrs. Cole was saying the other day she wanted something from Kingston. Mrs. Cole has servants to send. Can I do anything for you?' "'No, I thank you, but do come in. Who do you think is here? Miss Woodhouse and Miss Smith, so kind as to call to hear the new pianoforte. Do put up your horse at the crown and come in.' "'Well,' said he, in a deliberating manner, "'for five minutes, perhaps. "'And here is Mrs. Weston and Mr. Frank Churchill, too. "'Quite delightful. So many friends. "'No, not now, I thank you. "'I could not stay two minutes. "'I must get on to Kingston as fast as I can. "'Oh, do come in. "'They will be so very happy to see you. "'No, no, your room is full enough. "'I will call another day and hear the pianoforte. "'Well, I am so sorry. "'Oh, Mr. Knightley, what a delightful party last night. "'How extremely pleasant.' "'Did you ever see such dancing? Was it not delightful? Miss Woodhouse and Mr. Frank Churchill, I never saw anything equal to it.' "'Oh, very delightful indeed. I can say nothing less, for I suppose Miss Woodhouse and Mr. Frank Churchill are hearing everything that passes. And, raising his voice still more, I do not see why Miss Fairfax should not be mentioned too. I think Miss Fairfax dances very well, and Mrs. Weston is the very best country dance-player without exception in England.' Now, if your friends have any gratitude, they will say something pretty loud about you and me in return, but I cannot stay to hear it. Oh, Mr. Knightley, one moment more, something of consequence, so shocked. Jane and I are both so shocked about the apples. What is the matter now? To think of your sending us all your store apples. You said you had a great many, and now you have not one left. We really are so shocked. Mrs. Hodges may well be angry. William Larkins mentioned it here. You should not have done it. Indeed you should not. Ah, he is off. He never can bear to be thanked. But I thought he would have stayed now, and it would have been a pity not to have mentioned—well, returning to the room, I have not been able to succeed. Mr. Knightley cannot stop. He is going to Kingston. He asked me if he could do anything. Yes, said Jane. We heard his kind offers. We heard everything. Oh, yes, my dear. I dare say you might, because, you know, the door was open, and the window was open, and Mr. Knightley spoke loud. You must have heard everything, to be sure. Can I do anything for you at Kingston? said he. So I just mentioned— "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, must you be going? You seem but just come. So very obliging of you.' 
Emma found it really time to be at home. The visit had already lasted long, and on examining watches so much of the morning was perceived to be gone, that Mrs. Weston and her companion, taking leave also, could allow themselves only to walk with the two young ladies to Hartfield Gates, before they set off for Randall's. End of Volume 2, Chapter 10 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume Two, Chapter Eleven of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. It may be possible to do without dancing entirely. Instances have been known of young people passing many, many months successively, without being at any ball of any description, and no material injury accrue either to body or mind. But when a beginning is made, when the felicities of rapid motion have once been, though slightly felt it must be a very heavy set that does not ask for more. Frank Churchill had danced once at Highbury, and longed to dance again, and the last half-hour of an evening which Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded to spend with his daughter at Randall's was passed by the two people in schemes on the subject. Frank's was the first idea, and his the greatest zeal in pursuing it, for the lady was the best judge of the difficulties, and the most solicitous for accommodation and appearance." But still she had inclination enough for showing people again how delightfully Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse danced, for doing that in which she need not blush to compare herself with Jane Fairfax, and even for simple dancing itself, without any of the wicked aids of vanity, to assist him first in pacing out the room they were in to see what could be made to hold, and then in taking the dimensions of the other parlour, in the hope of discovering, in spite of all that Mr. Weston could say of their exactly equal size, that it was a little the largest. His first proposition and request, that the dance begun at Mr. Cole's should be finished there, that the same party should be collected, and the same musician engaged, met with the readiest acquiescence. Mr. Weston entered into the idea with thorough enjoyment, and Mrs. Weston most willingly undertook to play as long as they could wish to dance, and the interesting employment had followed, of reckoning up exactly who there would be, and portioning out the indispensable division of space to every couple. "'You and Miss Smith and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Coxes five, had been repeated many times over, and there will be the two Gilberts, young Cox, my father and myself, besides Mr. Knightley. Yes, that will be quite enough for pleasure. You and Miss Smith and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Coxes five, and for five couple there will be plenty of room.' but soon it came to be on one side, but will there be good room for five couple? I really do not think there will. On another, and after all, five couple are not enough to make it worth while to stand up. Five couple are nothing, when one thinks seriously about it. It will not do to invite five couple. It can be allowable only as the thought of the moment. Somebody said that Miss Gilbert was expected at her brother's, and must be invited with the rest. Somebody else believed Mrs. Gilbert would have danced the other evening, if she had been asked. A word was put in for the second young Cox, and at last, Mr. Weston naming one family of cousins who must be included, and another a very old acquaintance who could not be left out, it became a certainty that the five couple would be at least ten, and a very interesting speculation in what possible manner they could be disposed of. The doors of the two rooms were just opposite each other. Might not they use both rooms, and dance across the passage? It seemed the best scheme, and yet it was not so good but that many of them wanted a better. Emma said it would be awkward. Mrs. Weston was in distress about the supper, and Mr. Woodhouse opposed it earnestly on the score of health. It made him so very unhappy, indeed, that it could not be persevered in. "'Oh, no,' said he, "'it would be the extreme of imprudence. I could not bear it for Emma. Emma is not strong. She would catch a dreadful cold. So would poor little Harriet. So you would all. Mrs. Weston, you would be quite laid up. Do not let them talk of such a wild thing.' pray do not let them talk of it. That young man, speaking lower, is very thoughtless. Do not tell his father, but that young man is not quite the thing. He has been opening the doors very often this evening, and keeping them open very inconsiderately. He does not think of the draught. I do not mean to set you against him, but indeed he is not quite the thing. Mrs. Weston was sorry for such a charge. She knew the importance of it, and said everything in her power to do it away. Every door was now closed, the passage plan given up, and the first scheme of dancing only in the room they were in resorted to again, and with such good will on Frank Churchill's part, that the space which a quarter of an hour before had been deemed barely sufficient for five couple, was now endeavoured to be made out quite enough for ten. 
"'We were too magnificent,' said he. "'We allowed unnecessary room. Ten couple may stand here very well.' Emma demurred. "'It would be a crowd, a sad crowd, and what could be worse than dancing without space to turn in?' "'Very true,' he gravely replied. "'It was very bad. But still he went on measuring, and still he ended with, "'I think there will be very tolerable room for ten couple.' "'No, no,' said she. "'You are quite unreasonable. It would be dreadful to be standing so close. Nothing can be farther from pleasure than to be dancing in a crowd, and a crowd in a little room.' "'There is no denying it,' he replied. "'I agree with you exactly. A crowd in a little room. Miss Woodhouse, you have the art of giving pictures in a few words. Exquisite, quite exquisite. Still, however, having proceeded so far, one is unwilling to give the matter up. It would be a disappointment to my father, and altogether I do not know that— I am rather of opinion that ten couple might stand here very well. Emma perceived that the nature of his gallantry was a little self-willed, and that he would rather oppose than lose the pleasure of dancing with her, but she took the compliment and forgave the rest. Had she intended ever to marry him, it might have been worth while to pause and consider, and try to understand the value of his preference and the character of his temper, but for all the purposes of their acquaintance he was quite amiable enough. Before the middle of the next day he was at Hartfield, and he entered the room with such an agreeable smile as certified the continuance of the scheme. It soon appeared that he came to announce an improvement. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' he almost immediately began, "'your inclination for dancing has not been quite frightened away, I hope, by the terrors of my father's little rooms. I bring a new proposal on the subject, a thought of my father's, which waits only your approbation to be acted upon.' May I hope for the honour of your hand for the first two dances of this little projected ball, to be given not at Randall's, but at the Crown Inn? The Crown? Yes, if you and Mr. Woodhouse see no objection, and I trust you cannot. My father hopes his friends will be so kind as to visit him there. Better accommodations he can promise them, and not a less grateful welcome than at Randall's. It is his own idea. Mrs. Weston sees no objection to it, provided you are satisfied. This is what we all feel— "'Oh, you were perfectly right. Ten couple in either of the Randall's rooms would have been insufferable, dreadful. I felt how right you were the whole time, but was too anxious for securing anything to like to yield. Is it not a good exchange? You consent? I hope you consent? It appears to me a plan that nobody can object to, if Mr. and Mrs. Weston do not. I think it admirable, and as far as I can answer for myself, shall be most happy. It seems the only improvement that could be. Papa, do you not think it an excellent improvement?' She was obliged to repeat and explain it, before it was fully comprehended, and then, being quite new, farther representations were necessary to make it acceptable. No, he thought it very far from an improvement, a very bad plan, much worse than the other. A room at an inn was always damp and dangerous, never properly aired or fit to be inhabited. If they must dance, they had better dance at Randall's. He had never been in the room at the Crown in his life, did not know the people who kept it by sight. Oh, no, a very bad plan! they would catch worse colds at the crown than anywhere. "'I was going to observe, sir,' said Frank Churchill, "'that one of the great recommendations of this change would be the very little danger of anybody's catching cold, so much less danger at the crown than at Randall's. Mr. Perry might have reason to regret the alteration, but nobody else could.' "'Sir,' said Mr. Woodhouse, rather warmly, "'you are very much mistaken if you suppose Mr. Perry to be that sort of character. Mr. Perry is extremely concerned when any of us are ill.' but I do not understand how the room at the Crown can be safer for you than your father's house. From the very circumstance of its being larger, sir, we shall have no occasion to open the windows at all, not once the whole evening, and it is that dreadful habit of opening the windows, letting in cold air upon heated bodies, which, as you well know, sir, does the mischief. Open the windows? But surely, Mr. Churchill, nobody would think of opening the windows at Randall's. Nobody could be so imprudent. I never heard of such a thing— dancing, with open windows. I am sure neither your father nor Mrs. Weston, poor Miss Taylor that was, would suffer it. Ah, sir, but a thoughtless young person will sometimes step behind a window-curtain, and throw up a sash without its being suspected. I have often known it done myself. Have you indeed, sir? Bless me! I never could have supposed it. But I live out of the world, and am often astonished at what I hear. However, this does make a difference, and perhaps, when we come to talk it over— but these sort of things require a great deal of consideration. One cannot resolve upon them in a hurry. If Mr. and Mrs. Weston will be so obliging as to call here one morning, we may talk it over, and see what can be done. 
"'But, unfortunately, sir, my time is so limited—' "'Oh!' interrupted Emma. "'There will be plenty of time for talking everything over. There is no hurry at all. If it can be contrived to be at the crown, papa, it will be very convenient for the horses. They will be so near their own stable.' "'So they will, my dear. That is a great thing. Not that James ever complains, but it is right to spare our horses when we can. If I could be sure of the rooms being thoroughly aired. But is Mrs. Stokes to be trusted? I doubt it. I do not know her, even by sight. I can answer for everything of that nature, sir, because it will be under Mrs. Weston's care. Mrs. Weston undertakes to direct the whole. There, papa, now you must be satisfied. Our own dear Mrs. Weston, who is carefulness itself. Do you not remember what Mr. Perry said, so many years ago, when I had the measles? If Miss Taylor undertakes to wrap Miss Emma up, you need not have any fears, sir. How often have I heard you speak of it as such a compliment to her? Aye, very true. Mr. Perry did say so. I shall never forget it. Poor little Emma, you were very bad with the measles, that is, you would have been very bad, but for Perry's great attention. He came four times a day for a week. He said from the first it was a very good sort, which was our great comfort, but the measles are a dreadful complaint. I hope whenever poor Isabella's little ones have the measles, she will send for Perry. My father and Mrs. Weston are at the Crown at this moment, said Frank Churchill, examining the capabilities of the house. I left them there and came on to Hartfield, impatient for your opinion, and hoping you might be persuaded to join them and give your advice on the spot. I was desired to say so from both. It would be the greatest pleasure to them if you could allow me to attend you there. They can do nothing satisfactory without you. Emma was most happy to be called to such a council, and her father, engaging to think it over while she was gone, the two young people set off together without delay for the crown. There were Mr. and Mrs. Weston, delighted to see her and receive her approbation, very busy and very happy in their different way, she in some little distress, and he finding everything perfect. Emma, said she, this paper is worse than I expected. Look, in places you see it is dreadfully dirty, and the wainscot is more yellow and forlorn than anything I could have imagined. My dear, you are too particular, said her husband. What does all that signify? You will see nothing of it by candlelight. It will be as clean as Randall's by candlelight. We never see anything of it on our club nights. The ladies here probably exchanged looks which meant, men never know when things are dirty or not and the gentlemen perhaps thought each to himself, women will have their little nonsenses and needless cares. One perplexity, however, arose, which the gentlemen did not disdain. It regarded a supper-room. At the time of the ballrooms being built, suppers had not been in question, and a small card-room adjoining was the only addition. What was to be done? This card-room would be wanted as a card-room now, or, if cards were conveniently voted unnecessary by their four selves, still was it not too small for any comfortable supper? Another room of a much better size might be secured for the purpose, but it was at the other end of the house, and a long, awkward passage must be gone through to get at it. This made a difficulty. Mrs. Weston was afraid of draughts for the young people in that passage, and neither Emma nor the gentleman could tolerate the prospect of being miserably crowded at supper. Mrs. Weston proposed, having no regular supper, merely sandwiches, etc., set out in the little room, but that was scouted as a wretched suggestion. A private dance, without sitting down to supper, was pronounced an infamous fraud upon the rights of men and women, and Mrs. Weston must not speak of it again. She then took another line of expediency, and looking into the doubtful room, observed, "'I do not think it is so very small. We shall not be many, you know.' and Mr. Weston at the same time, walking briskly with long steps through the passage, was calling out, "'You talk a great deal of the length of this passage, my dear. It is a mere nothing, after all, and not the least draught from the stairs.' "'I wish,' said Mrs. Weston, "'one could know what arrangement our guests in general would like best. To know what could be most generally pleasing must be our object, if one could but tell what that would be.' "'Yes, very true,' cried Frank, "'very true. You want your neighbour's opinions.' I do not wonder at you. If one could ascertain what the chief of them, the Coles, for instance, they are not far off, shall I call upon them? Or Miss Bates? She is still nearer. And I do not know whether Miss Bates is not as likely to understand the inclinations of the rest of the people as anybody. I think we do want a larger council. Suppose I go and invite Miss Bates to join us. Well, if you please, said Mrs. Weston, rather hesitatingly, if you think she will be of any use— "'You will get nothing to the purpose from Miss Bates,' said Emma. "'She will be all delight and gratitude, but she will tell you nothing. 
She will not even listen to your questions. I see no advantage in consulting Miss Bates. But she is so amusing, so extremely amusing. I am very fond of hearing Miss Bates talk. And I need not bring the whole family, you know. Here Mr. Weston joined them, and on hearing what was proposed, gave it his decided approbation. "'Aye, do, Frank. Go and fetch Miss Bates, and let us end the matter at once. She will enjoy the scheme, I am sure, and I do not know a properer person for showing us how to do away difficulties. Fetch Miss Bates. We are growing a little too nice. She is a standing lesson of how to be happy. But fetch them both. Invite them both.' "'Both, sir. Can the old lady—' "'The old lady—' "'No, the young lady, to be sure. I shall think you a great blockhead, Frank, if you bring the aunt without the niece.' "'Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I did not immediately recollect. Undoubtedly, if you wish it, I will endeavour to persuade them both.' And away he ran. Long before he reappeared, attending the short, neat, brisk-moving aunt and her elegant niece, Mrs. Weston, like a sweet-tempered woman and a good wife, had examined the passage again, and found the evils of it much less than she had supposed before, indeed very trifling, and here ended the difficulties of decision. All the rest, in speculation at least, was perfectly smooth. All the minor arrangements of table and chair, lights and music, tea and supper, made themselves or were left as mere trifles to be settled at any time between Mrs. Weston and Mrs. Stokes. Everybody invited was certainly to come. Frank had already written to Enscombe to propose staying a few days beyond his fortnight, which could not possibly be refused, and a delightful dance it was to be. Most cordially, when Miss Bates arrived, did she agree that it must— as a counsellor she was not wanted, but as an approver, a much safer character, she was truly welcome. Her approbation, at once general and minute, warm and incessant, could not but please, and for another half-hour they were all walking to and fro, between the different rooms, some suggesting, some attending, and all in happy enjoyment of the future. The party did not break up without Emma's being positively secured for the first two dances by the hero of the evening, nor without her overhearing Mr. Weston whisper to his wife, "'He has asked her, my dear. That's right. I knew he would.'" End of Volume 2, Chapter 11 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume 2, Chapter 12 of Emma by Jane Austen Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain only one thing was wanting to make the prospect of the ball completely satisfactory to Emma, its being fixed for a day within the granted term of Frank Churchill's stay in Surrey, for in spite of Mr. Weston's confidence, she could not think it so very impossible that the Churchills might not allow their nephew to remain a day beyond his fortnight. But this was not judged feasible. The preparations must take their time. Nothing could be properly ready till the third week were entered on, and for a few days they must be planning, proceeding, and hoping in uncertainty, at the risk, in her opinion, the great risk of its being all in vain. Enscombe, however, was gracious, gracious in fact, if not in word. His wish of staying longer evidently did not please, but it was not opposed. All was safe and prosperous, and as the removal of one solicitude generally makes way for another, Emma, being now certain of her ball, began to adopt as the next vexation Mr. Knightley's provoking indifference about it. Either because he did not dance himself, or because the plan had been formed without his being consulted, he seemed resolved that it should not interest him, determined against its exciting any present curiosity, or affording him any future amusement. To her voluntary communications Emma could get no more approving reply than, "'Very well, if the Westons think it worth while to be at all this trouble for a few hours of noisy entertainment, I have nothing to say against it, but that they shall not choose pleasures for me. Oh, yes, I must be there, I could not refuse, and I will keep as much awake as I can, but I would rather be at home, looking over William Larkins's week's account, much rather, I confess, pleasure in seeing dancing. Not I, indeed, I never look at it. I do not know who does. Fine dancing, I believe, like virtue, must be its own reward. Those who are standing by are usually thinking of something very different. This, Emma felt, was aimed at her, and it made her quite angry. It was not in compliment to Jane Fairfax, however, that he was so indifferent, or so indignant. He was not guided by her feelings in reprobating the ball, for she enjoyed the thought of it to an extraordinary degree. It made her animated, open-hearted, she voluntarily said, "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I hope nothing may happen to prevent the ball. What a disappointment it would be! I do look forward to it, I own, with very great pleasure.' 
It was not to oblige Jane Fairfax, therefore, that he would have preferred the society of William Larkins. No, she was more and more convinced that Mrs. Weston was quite mistaken in that surmise. There was a great deal of friendly and of compassionate attachment on his side, but no love. Alas, there was soon no leisure for quarrelling with Mr. Knightley. Two days of joyful security were immediately followed by the overthrow of everything. A letter arrived from Mr. Churchill to urge his nephew's instant return. Mrs. Churchill was unwell, far too unwell to do without him. She had been in a very suffering state, so said her husband, when writing to her nephew two days before, though from her usual unwillingness to give pain, and constant habit of never thinking of herself, she had not mentioned it, but now she was too ill to trifle, and must entreat him to set off for Enscombe without delay. The substance of this letter was forwarded to Emma, in a note from Mrs. Weston, instantly. As to his going it was inevitable. He must be gone within a few hours, though without feeling any real alarm for his aunt, to lessen his repugnance. He knew her illnesses, they never occurred but for her own convenience." Mrs. Weston added, that he could only allow himself time to hurry to Highbury after breakfast, and take leave of the few friends there whom he could suppose to feel any interest in him, and that he might be expected at Hartfield very soon. This wretched note was the finale of Emma's breakfast. When once it had been read, there was no doing anything but lament and exclaim. The loss of the ball, the loss of the young man, all that the young man might be feeling. It was too wretched. Such a delightful evening as it would have been everybody so happy, and she and her partner the happiest. I said it would be so, was the only consolation. Her father's feelings were quite distinct. He thought principally of Mrs. Churchill's illness, and wanted to know how she was treated, and as for the ball it was shocking to have dear Emma disappointed, but they would all be safer at home. Emma was ready for her visitor some time before he appeared, but if this reflected at all upon his impatience, his sorrowful look and total want of spirits when he did come might redeem him. He felt the going away almost too much to speak of it. His dejection was most evident. He sat really lost in thought for the first few minutes, and when rousing himself it was only to say, "'Of all the horrid things, leave-taking is the worst.' "'But you will come again,' said Emma. "'This will not be your only visit to Randall's.' Ah, shaking his head, the uncertainty of when I may be able to return. I shall try for it with a zeal. It will be the object of all my thoughts and cares. And if my uncle and aunt go to town this spring, but I am afraid they did not stir last spring, I am afraid it is a custom gone for ever. Our poor ball must be given up. Ah, that ball! Why did we wait for anything? Why not seize the pleasure at once? How often is happiness destroyed by preparation— foolish preparation. You told us it would be so. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, why are you always so right? Indeed, I am very sorry to be right in this instance. I would much rather have been merry than wise. If I can come again, we are still to have our ball. My father depends on it. Do not forget your engagement. Emma looked graciously. Such a fortnight as it has been, he continued, every day more precious and more delightful than the day before, every day making me less fit to bear any other place. Happy those who can remain at Highbury. "'As you do us such ample justice now,' said Emma, laughing, "'I will venture to ask whether you did not come a little doubtfully at first. Do we not rather surpass your expectations? I am sure we do. I am sure you did not much expect to like us. You would not have been so long in coming if you had had a pleasant idea of Highbury.' He laughed rather consciously, and though denying the sentiment, Emma was convinced that it had been so. "'And you must be off this very morning?' "'Yes, my father is to join me here, and we shall walk back together, and I must be off immediately. I am almost afraid that every moment will bring him. "'Not five minutes to spare even for your friends, Miss Fairfax and Miss Bates. How unlucky! Miss Bates's powerful argumentative mind might have strengthened yours. "'Yes, I have called there. Passing at the door, I thought it better. It was a right thing to do. I went in for three minutes, and was detained by Miss Bates's being absent.' She was out, and I felt it impossible not to wait till she came in. She is a woman that one may, that one must laugh at, but that one would not wish slight. It was better to pay my visit then. He hesitated, got up, walked to a window. In short, said he, perhaps, Miss Woodhouse, I think you can hardly be quite without suspicion. He looked at her, as if wanting to read her thoughts. She hardly knew what to say. It seemed like the forerunner of something absolutely serious, which she did not wish— 
Forcing herself to speak, therefore, in the hope of putting it by, she calmly said, "'You are quite in the right. It was most natural to pay your visit, then—' He was silent. She believed he was looking at her, probably reflecting on what she had said, and trying to understand the manner. She heard him sigh. It was natural for him to feel that he had cause to sigh. He could not believe her to be encouraging him. A few awkward moments passed, and he sat down again, and in a more determined manner said, "'It was something to feel that all the rest of my time might be given to Hartfield. My regard for Hartfield is most warm.' He stopped again, rose again, and seemed quite embarrassed. He was more in love with her than Emma had supposed, and who can say how it might have ended if his father had not made his appearance? Mr. Woodhouse soon followed, and the necessity of exertion made him composed. A few minutes more, however, completed the present trial. Mr. Weston, always alert when business was to be done, and as incapable of procrastinating any evil that was inevitable, as of foreseeing any that was doubtful, said, it was time to go, and the young man, though he might and did sigh, could not but agree to take leave. "'I shall hear about you all,' he said. "'That is my chief consolation. I shall hear of everything that is going on among you. I have engaged Mrs. Weston to correspond with me. She has been so kind as to promise it. Oh, the blessing of a female correspondent when one is really interested in the absent! She will tell me everything. In her letters I shall be at dear Highbury again.' A very friendly shake of the hand, a very earnest good-bye, closed the speech, and the door had soon shut out Frank Churchill. Short had been the notice, short their meeting, he was gone, and Emma felt so sorry to part, and foresaw so great a loss to their little society from his absence, as to begin to be afraid of being too sorry, and feeling it too much. It was a sad change. They had been meeting almost every day since his arrival. Certainly his being at Randall's had given great spirit to the last two weeks, indescribable spirit, the idea, the expectation of seeing him which every morning had brought— the assurance of his attentions, his liveliness, his manners. It had been a very happy fortnight, and forlorn must be the sinking from it into the common course of Hartfield days. To complete every other recommendation, he had almost told her that he loved her. What strength, or what constancy of affection, he might be subject to, was another point. But at present she could not doubt his having a decidedly warm admiration, a conscious preference of herself, and this persuasion, joined to all the rest, made her think that she must be a little in love with him, in spite of every previous determination against it. "'I certainly must,' said she. "'This sensation of listlessness, weariness, stupidity, this disinclination to sit down and employ myself, this feeling of everything's being dull and insipid about the house, I must be in love. I should be the oddest creature in the world if I were not, for a few weeks, at least.' Well, evil to some is always good to others. I shall have many fellow mourners for the ball, if not for Frank Churchill, but Mr. Knightley will be happy. He may spend the evening with his dear William Larkins now, if he likes. Mr. Knightley, however, showed no triumphant happiness. He could not say that he was sorry on his own account. His very cheerful look would have contradicted him if he had, but he said, and very steadily, that he was sorry for the disappointment of the others, and with considerable kindness added, you, Emma, who have so few opportunities of dancing, you are really out of luck. You are very much out of luck. It was some days before she saw Jane Fairfax, to judge of her honest regret in this woeful change, but when they did meet, her composure was odious. She had been particularly unwell, however, suffering from headache to a degree which made her aunt declare that had the ball taken place, she did not think Jane could have attended it, and it was charity to impute some of her unbecoming indifference to the languor of ill health. End of Volume 2, Chapter 12 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org